Ah, no, era para acá, no. Hello and welcome to uh, this uh, webinar, uh, Early Warning for Epidemics. And today you will learn about uh, early warning for mosquito-borne diseases and what it is about and what it actually delivers already. So my name is Bentele Yabi. I'm going to be your host in this joint next year's and AVA, so Early Warning for Mosquito-Borne Diseases webinar. Before we start, there's um, something I want to um, inform you about for housekeeping, and you will meet the rest of the speakers and the host. You, I will ask my my webinar um, co colleagues here to to turn on their cameras. Um, First of all, you see here, I see that everybody is saying hello. Hello, Yanis, Guillaume, Anna, Darinka, Nicolas, Lucie. Welcome, so so glad to see you here. And this is exactly where you're going to ask questions and comment during the webinar. So the webinar is actually a little bit more like a workshop. So we are uh, going to uh, be around two, two hours, a little bit between two hours and two and a half hour. And we will have a break in between. Uh, we have uh, sectioned this webinar in four sections. So you will um, get information about what AVA is, and then you will get information about the usage, uh, and some, and finally, some about the politics. And Haris Contos will explain the, uh, the uh, agenda in more detail for you just shortly. Um, the Q&A is in the chat. If you want to ask questions inside to come into the room as where we are now, you can actually raise your hand. And But that will be at the Q&A at the end. We um, calculate to be on the end at uh, uh, starting the Q&A at four o'clock. So, uh, but what it's needed for you in order to get in here is to have a good internet connection obviously a camera and a microphone and also use a chrome browser that's the certain requirements in a, in order for you to be able to join and then you just raise your hand but that's towards the end however you can ask questions during the entire webinar and we will collect those questions and make sure that we ask them to the uh, speakers 
And I think uh, I can also say that this webinar will be recorded, so don't worry about that. Um, and I think we are ready to uh, to start. Uh, I will be here during the entire webinar, but Haris will guide you through the program. And I think, Haris, are you ready to guide the audience and kick off this wonderful webinar? Thank you, Veda. Thank you very much. Uh, dear participants, uh, we are pleased and honored by your participation. We thank you for your interest and uh, we welcome you all in this meeting. I'm privileged to speak on behalf of the AOA Consortium. It is comprising of esteemed professionals in key organizations from Europe. Organizations assuming roles to support decision making in the control of mosquito borne diseases in their countries. Before going on, let me underline that EOA is an action of a community of experts working on a voluntary basis in the framework of the Eurogeo Action Group for Epidemics. And uh, at this point, uh, I would like to give uh, uh, the floor and open the meeting uh, with the greeting speech of uh, our uh, good friend and close collaborator for many years, uh, the head of external relations at the Geo Secretariat, our friend Dr. Stephen Ramaz. Stephen, uh, you can take the floor. Thank you. Referisto, uh, Ares, and uh, Tak, Bente. Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Group on Earth Observations, uh, also known as GEO. I'm uh, the GEO Secretary here in Geneva. I'm particularly pleased um, on a personal level to see this activity, since it's something I supported when I was working for the Rural Bank in 2015 in Tanzania. So it's nice to see the Earth Observations angle uh, included as well. The uh, EWA, as I believe it's known, the Early Warning System for Mosquito-Borne Diseases, is, uh, I, I describe it as representative of the many international activities that are already underway in the geo community. In fact, as a, as a global intergovernmental partnership working in over 100 countries, geo operates what are called regional geos. And you just heard Harris mention Eurogeo, which is the European Regional Geo. And that's where they offer the umbrella for this activity, which is known as Earth Observations for Epidemics of Vector-Borne Diseases, EO for evidence. So EWA and the approach to open and uh, freely available data also matches the vision and mission of Geo. And it aligns very nicely with some of our uh, some activities from the GEO work program. So we have uh, about 65 activities in the work program, and some, some of those are, are closely linked, for example, EO for Health. So I just say uh, thanks again, and uh, I'd like to wish you a very successful workshop. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much, indeed. Um, uh, we will uh, continue with the keynote speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Nikolaos Stylianakis from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. We are eager to hear to Nicolas uh, 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 presentation about the infectious diseases in the global challenging environment. Nicolaos, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Harris. Uh, I will turn on the file. Okay, so let me share the screen. Okay. And uh, here we go. So first of all, let me thank you for the organize the thank the organizers for the kind invitation to to introduce this uh, webinar. Um, I will try to give you an overview of, of what uh, we've been observing over the last decades. So uh, we've been witnessing actually a massive or a substantial global change, environmental change, um, basically attributed to anthropogenic pressures. And these environmental changes are going to have, uh, or we expect them to have, and some of these, uh, we have some always already substantial observations on that. Um, um, they may, they will influence also if the, the transmission dynamics and the control 
of infectious diseases which associated, uh, which are related or sensitive to environmental changes, including climate change. And a typical example of that is actually what happened back in 1999. This is actually the front page of a, of a magazine uh, back in 2000, actually showing this case. This is the introduction of West Nile virus in the United States. Uh, an infectious disease that it was not present uh, in the Americas uh, by that time, at least it was not uh, detected. And it was observed first time in New York, introduced there, and ever since has spread around the continent, um, indicating the, the potential of these type of diseases to spread uh, around the world. So this is uh, all uh, embedded in the issue of global environmental change and health. And as I said, we've been observing a escalating human pressure on global environment. And this is not only the changes we observe with climate, but you have also land degradation and land desertification. So land use and cover has been changing. We have biodiversity loss, urbanization plays a major role. So you have a massive uh, intervention there from with the human influence. And all this is going to have um, some health impacts. They can be direct health impacts, like uh, the extreme weather events we've been observing over the last couple of de decades or even longer. Uh, we're going to have ecosystem-mediated health impacts. Uh, and one of them is the, the risk the, on infectious disease, which is going to alter, actually, or to be altered by that, and some indirect health impacts also. Two. So um, this is the big picture of the whole um, issue, and uh, what I'm going to refer here is I will pick uh, on the on the point of uh, infectious diseases. So I will try to show you um, what we've been observing over the last uh, year. So this is a very small example, a very simple example. You know, if this is French Polynesia in the Pacific Ocean, it is very far away from Europe. Actually, it's um, eighteen thousand kilometers from France. So one might think, uh, so what is uh, of interest? Why should I care about what is going on there? But I will show you that, or try to convince you that it is not that trivial. There are reasons for that. So in 2013-14, there was a Zika, Zika virus outbreak there with about 20,000 persons infected, estimated, and uh, about 8,700 suspected cases with certain clinical symptoms, which are not, not, are not they're really serious. So the outbreak actually went entirely unnoticed uh, to the public. Of course, it was, was noticed by the scientific community, but it was entirely not, unnoticed by the public. And um, what was noticed, of course, is well, the outbreak that took place one year later in Brazil in, in 2015. Uh, so um, in general, what we've been observing globally uh, with vector-borne diseases, so diseases which are transmitted by by mosquitoes, um, um, uh, ticks, um, and other um, vectors, um, we see. And if I I can make I, I can show that the example of dengue, West Nile virus, chikungunya, and Zika, we see changes. And for dengue, for instance, we've reached we've seen a, a massive emergence over the last 20, 30 years. It has been spreading now in 100 countries. Um, the West Nile virus case, which I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, it was introduced to the virus, it was introduced in 1999. Today we have a cumulative in the United States about 52, 53,000 cases observed. It should be mentioned here that a very small number of the infections are observed, the most, the highest, a, a multiple number is not observed because they the, the people are, which are infected, they, they, um, they are not, there is no major surveillance there, and so many of them very, have very mild symptoms. But there are many cases with serious symptoms. So in the United States, they have uh, uh, about 25,000 uh, neuroinvasive cases with neuroinvasive uh, uh, disease and uh, about 2,400 deaths. So the disease is today prevalent uh, in all over in America, from Canada, to Argentina. Actually, there has been cases in, uh, well, at least the mosquito was found in Thompson, Canada, which is 57 degrees north. Um, so um, this happened within 20 years, basically. 
And uh, we another example is chikungunya, a major outbreak in Reunion in 2005 with 270,000 cases. And um, the Zika virus outbreak, which um, has been massively in the media, and um, in 2015 in Brazil. Now, if we move from the global to, to Europe, one would think, uh, well, Europe is not that bad, but we should think about, you know, the dengue was, uh, the last major outbreak in dengue was 1927, 28 in Greece. Ever since we hadn't seen anything, and uh, today it is endemic in Madeira. Madeira is Portugal. So we had a major outbreak in 2012. And we have several autochthonous cases in 2010, 2013, 15 in southern France. We had two major outbreaks of chikungunya in 2007, 2017 in Italy. And uh, West Nile virus has been established basically in southern Europe now. In 2018, please note that we had only in 2018, 2083 cases. And for the period between 2010 and 2017, we had 1,800 cases. So this shows you the potential, the explosive potential this disease may have. And we actually have been ignoring a little bit. So we don't know when it's going to happen and what is you know, the extension of, of, of the whole outbreak. So we cannot rely on the small numbers we've, we've been observing up to now. Um, and how this um, to 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 a bar, you know the a, a a vector to be established a pathogen to be established has to actually s pass certain barriers and here this is a, a nice schematic representation of that which I borrowed from a publication two years ago uh, showing how that happened in 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 the United States with introduction of the West Nile virus in North America so we had basically the introduction through an infected mosquito or person imported in a plane. Um, then we had, you know, the dispersal, and then we had an evolutionary process taking place there, um, where the virus has been evolving for transmission to some kind, some kind of colder environment, and the virus made it. And in some species, it could survive, and uh, in the end, it was, you know, the mosquito and the climate change could actually add to the whole process by simply having a, a very hot year that would facilitate uh, the, the establishment. And this is what happened actually uh, with the West Nile virus introduction in the, in the United States, which is, as I said, is now prevalent all over the Americas. Uh, in Europe, um, the, we worry about two types of mosquitoes who, who have been spreading actually Aedes albopictus, which is uh, now in Europe quite prevalent in many areas. The red is established, the green light, the yellow light is, uh, um, the yellow color is introduced and the green is uh, still, um, uh, uh, weeks. we haven't, uh, uh, in the, it is similar also for, for, so you see that for Aedes albopictus, there is, uh, there is widespread actually of this uh, mosquito in Europe. Uh, and um, for Aedes aegypti, the situation is slightly different, is easier. We don't observe uh, introduction or establishment, but we still um, have, um, this is uh, is moving towards Europe. So it's probably it's a question of, of, of time, with the exception, I think, of the Netherlands, which is in yellow, as you can see. Um, so if I come back to the typical example of West Nile virus in Europe, we have, um, these are, in 2010, we, we had in 2010 we had a major outbreak it was the first major outbreak actually and then uh, in the period 2011 to 2019 as you can see uh, we have a, a, a geographical expansion throughout uh, southern europe and the eastern europe now this is the observation but this is not if we move now to the theory and we uh, look at uh, and some mathematical models which uh, actually try to capture the transmission dynamics of these type of diseases, you can see that um, this is the formula for the basic production number that everybody knows actually today uh, from the COVID uh, uh, outbreak. But you can uh, actually, one can determine from a mathematical model a similar uh, number with similar meaning actually. Um, uh, for uh, vector-borne diseases. And you can see this number, it consists of several parameters. And these parameters, if you look at these parameters, uh, almost all of them 
are actually referred to features of the mosquito, so to the vector. In other words, whether it is the biting rate of the mosquito or the probability of an uninfected mosquito to acquire infection, so all these are parameters that so they are not so the the the, the this quantity that that tells us something about the transmissibility of the uh, pathogen is actually strongly dependent on the mosquito and the mosquito is strongly dependent on the environmental conditions. In other words, we have to take care about the environmental conditions to see what is happening there in order to understand how these infections actually, uh, these pathogens transmit. Now, what are the tools we have besides the mathematical models uh, uh, we I've just mentioned, uh, we can do health risk assessment and for this we have several tools. First of all, of course, we start with surveillance systems and to what extent the current surveillance systems are su sufficient to capture the big picture of uh, what is going on with vector-borne disease is, is, is an open question. We need to do a better surveillance in this area. And then we have assessment tools like satellite remote sensing, GIS, geographical information systems, and uh, statistical techniques, risk mapping, and never in the end, mathematical and statistical modeling. And we need them just to tackle issues like to estimate uh, future distribution of the vector species, the vector species under different scenarios of environmental change, um, to look at the refinement of distribution models for vector species, to identify areas that are at higher risk of being invaded by new vectors to identify vectors that pose serious threat in a given area or to model the interaction between vector pathogens and humans dynamically. So it is under certain conditions of, of climate variability or, or environmental change. So we have the tools for that. And we have also the surveillance systems, but we have to become better in, 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 in the work we are doing. Coming back to the seek outbreak, which I showed you for 2013 2013-2014, uh, as you can see here, this is a World Health Organization map. Uh, Zika was identified first in 1947 in Uganda, so it is not new. But over the decades, it spread throughout the world, mainly the Southern Hemisphere. And what we observed was the major, what we noticed, at least through the media, was the major 2015 outbreak in Brazil. So we have a substantial spread of Zika virus. Uh, we've had that over the decades, but it was not so high and suddenly became quite a lot when we had the major outbreak in Brazil. And now the question I, I asked at the beginning was to what extent uh, uh, this can be um i think this, this we can have you know to what extent it can move to other areas even far away and this is clear that this can happen so and this is a typical you know a simple simulation a modeling where actually you can see the top 100 cities to which zika might be imported that was done in back in 19 in 2015 2016 when the zika virus outbreak in uh in, in Brazil took place, and uh, it was basically a, proje a projection on how which cities would be actually reached first or would be reached uh, over time uh, or for by the Zika virus. So it is not it is not it was a hypothetical scenario, but based on the on the data they had and the massive interconnectedness we have today, there is no question that this is a realistic scenario, and this. Um, can happen also for infectious diseases, which are have substantial actually uh, um, consequences for human health. Now, in concluding, um, what I wanted to say is that we should try to adapt to that, and the mitigation is a good thing. And uh, but one has to think that mitigation takes time. So we have in the meantime to adapt, and adaptation can happen with the tools we have, but we have to expand them. One is the enhancement of epidemiological surveillance. There we have to integrate more factors, like climatic and environmental factors, and um, we have to do surveillance for vector pathogen and reservoirs more. Uh, so this is one thing that has to happen, in particular with respect to the environmental conditions. The second is we have to improve and um, expand in our health risk assessments so that we can inform adaptation with all these tools I've just mentioned. 
And uh, we can use them to do for forecasting readiness, for early detection, rapid response, early warning system, the development of early warning systems. So actually to work on preparedness and response to these uh, if something happens in this direction, which will probably happen and is happening actually also today. The other thing is, of course, we have to adapt the healthcare services, especially for vulnerable groups. This actually is not happening today. Uh, and maybe one reason is that all these issues seem to be very far away in time. And in policy, usually people, you know, policymakers think in rather, especially politicians, look, look very often look in short term uh, re responses. The other thing is the training of for public health practitioners. And not only them, also people from other disciplines who are supposed to understand what it means, you know, what it means to have a, a the, the, the association between the transmission dynamics and control of infectious diseases uh, and the association with, uh, with the global environmental change. And for all these issues, uh, they've been addressed actually at the European level, but there is a very high variability between European countries, and this has to be improved. And for that reason, we've been also working also in the GRC on that in close collaboration also with uh, uh, with uh, the Greek group. And uh, the IVA concept uh, has been actually one of the products we've been actually developing together. And we hope to arrive a point where to reach a point where we can uh, use it widely um, in Europe, and um, it could help us to improve all these. Um, components. So thank you very much for that. And I give back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can uh, you unshare? Yes. yes. Wait a second. Share the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Thank you very much yeah. for your yeah. very interesting and uh, enlightening uh, presentation, introducing us to the problem that we face as humanity globally. You refer to the environmental conditions to account for the environmental and climatological conditions. You refer to the remote sensing and geospatial information data to be integrated. Uh, you refer to the need for improvement of risk assessment and to the need of harmonization of actions at uh, uh, European, even global level. So this is some of the issues that we try to uh, raise in the development with the development of AWA. Uh, and uh, I think this brings uh, uh, to the next presentation of the agenda, which is actually me, that I'm uh, giving a presentation of the, uh, an overview of the EWA concept, the EWA system. Uh, let me just uh, upload the presentation on the screen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the overview of uh, the EWA is um, following in this presentation. Uh, the AOA is considered to be a key tool uh, to the epidemics arsenal. Uh, listening to your presentation, Nikos, we understand that uh, the, the problem of uh, vector and mosquito-borne diseases uh, in Europe is uh, just around the corner. And uh, there is a continuous need of uh, not only uh, being able to, to, to follow, to monitor, but at the same time to forecast what is about the imminent risk in, uh, in regard to the mosquito risk and uh, mosquito-borne diseases risk. And this gave birth to the EWA system. EWA is not just a system, it is at the same time a network, as I explained before, uh, that uh, it is uh, uh, generated in the framework of uh, the Eurogeo Action Group. And all our efforts is to develop a system which is an early warning, this early warning system, uh, which offers a scalable, reliable and sustainable uh, solution relying on the processing of big earth observation data uh, in combination with histories of entomological, epidemiological, and socioeconomic data in order to, for to forecast the mosquito risk and uh, mosquito borne diseases risk. And the sustainability of the system lies with uh, priorities, uh, as they have been said in uh, geo societal benefit areas uh, before, but and so now in the framework of the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, in line with priorities of targets in goals uh, number 3, 11 and 13, referring to the good health and well-being, the sustainable cities and communities and the climate action and the adaptation to climate change. Um, uh, 
As a system and uh, as an action, we built on the geo uh, advocate, engage, and uh, deliver. We advocate exhausting inventories of uh, needs, uh, regional priorities, and common challenges at regional level. But at the same time, uh, in EOA, we try to report all the existing, at least at European Union level, scales, observational capacities, uh, innovation, and data, data which are freely available to be used for the development of, uh, of uh, our system. At the same time, we engage a good community, and uh, there's a lot of effort there into the engagement of a good community of stakeholders. Across the entire value adding chain, and, uh, a lot of the effort is towards the engagement of uh, health authorities and uh, uh, control and mosquito control institutions. And we delivered three types of products. Uh, of course, the, the, the digital early warning services, which are provided on a, a systematic, um, real-time um, condition to the end users uh, in order to support the daily practice. But in addition to that, uh, EUA uh, envisages towards the, the delivery of a roadmap and action plan so as you, uh, as, as we are able to uh, create a, a specification uh, and a standard in regard to services and uh, quality assessment of the services. And uh, uh, last but not least, as we said, AOI is a network. So at the same time, it generates a network and tries to maintain a network of stakeholders uh, from, from as many countries uh, from uh, European and uh, non-European territories. We are a, a partnership scheme of uh, 15 partners from five countries, from Greece, uh, Serbia, uh, Italy, France, and Germany. I have to tell you here that uh, this partnership scheme is not closed. It's not a contract, it's not a grant. It is a voluntary action, so we are open, and uh, we will welcome any interested uh, um, organization and country that uh, would like to join and uh, share with us uh, data and uh, uh, know-how. Uh, together with us, uh, there is a network so far of 37 uh, stakeholders acting globally in the domain, not only in Europe, but also in India, in Latin America, and the uh, US. Uh, they are organizations that um, have a mandate in uh, mosquito control and mosquito-borne disease control, and they are providing us with their comments and feedback, very useful, uh, very useful uh, information and know-how for the development of the system. But, uh, of course, we do not forget that uh, very closely to us, we have a good uh, number of uh, end-user organizations and uh, the so-called co-designers. These are the organizations that uh, work together with us uh, in order to develop the services, in order to transform the services to useful information, useful for them to, uh, to, to support the, the decision making on, and the daily practice. And these organizations are uh, uh, taking the services, uh, assessing them, uh, validating them, and providing us uh, back feedback so as to customize them uh, and uh, become uh, uh, compliant to their daily need. The team uh, works under the principle together everyone achieves more. And uh, it is an interdisciplinary team uh, from scientists from different uh, domains, medicine and veterinary medicine, medicine, mosquito surveillance, mosquito control, earth observation and geospatial analysis, predictive modeling, system and platform development. The team is led by the National Observatory of Athens, the Center of Earth Observation Research and Satellite Remote Sensing. Uh, I, I have the honor, indeed, to coordinate this uh, uh, group of experts. Uh, from Europe, and uh, I thank all of them for uh, their contribution and the excellent experience working with them. And so from Greece, uh, uh, we are collaborating with the Eco Development SA company, which is a leading company in the domain of mosquito control in Greece. The University of Patras, the Laboratory of Atmospheric Physics, uh, providing us uh, a high, high, high expertise in, in the domain of predictive modeling and the uh, universities of Thessaloniki and the University of Thessaly that uh, they participate in our group with their uh, schools of um, uh, uh, hygiene and uh, epidemiology and uh, medical schools. 
de Instituto Geoprofilático Experimental de la Venecia, de Edmund Mach Foundation, de la Universidad de Trento, are our partners from Italy. De, uh, from Serbia, the Medical School and the Veterinary Entomology and the Medicine School from the University of Novi Sad and uh, the Veterinary uh, Scientific Institute from Novi Sad as well from Serbia. The German Mosquito Control Association, KABS, and the Bernard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine are our partners from Germany. And uh, the public operator in charge of mosquito nuisance control of the uh, so-called H Mediterranean is our partner from France. The AOA system uh, exploits open and freely available uh, space-based and in-situ data, uh, satellite data mentioned by Nikos before, Earth observation data, but also meteorological and environmental data. And we rely on the exploitation and use of state-of-the-art observation technology, including Copernicus Sentinel data, the Copernicus uh, core uh, missions and services, such as the atmospheric monitoring service, the land monitoring service, the climatic monitoring service. EOA is a cloud uh, environment, is a cloud-based solution. Uh, it's, uses, it's using a lot the CreoBS platform for accessing directly to the satellite data, for processing the data, but when and where it is needed, it is, it is a cloud agnostic system. It's using also cloud from other providers, such as Google Earth Engine, in order to complement the satellite observations and uh, in order to get access to more scripts for satellite processing. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system which uh, links with many different uh, cloud platforms for the exploitation of data and processing the data. And uh, we benefit from a suite of uh, automated pipelines uh, uh, for pre-processing and processing of Earth observation data, as, as well as uh, the processing of endomological, epidemiological, and toxicity data. The scalability of the system is ensured by the use of uh, development and use of generic models, which in turn facilitate the transferability of the system into multiple geographic regions. In uh, regarding the operationality of the system, we have envisaged two pillars. One that it is the fully operational, it is the pillar which is delivering the digital services uh, in, uh, in, uh, on, uh, daily to the end users for the support of the practices. But we have also envisaged the so-called pre-operational pillar is there where we develop the, the research uh, or the research actually is uh, developed there in order to become a, a pre-operational solution to be uh, tested and validated. And one it is, once it is validated, it is migrated into the operational pillar to be provided in the next mosquito season uh, uh, to the end users for uh, support the decision making. It is a modular system. The backbone of the system is um, the so-called data sources and acquisition tier, which is uh, uh, a, a, a suite of APIs of uh, plug-ins uh, 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 linking to uh, networks of uh, mosquito traps, uh, to public health authorities, to public statistical authorities, as well as to the ground segments of uh, Copernicus and uh, other acquisition facilities, satellite data acquisition facilities, as well as to data repositories and data portals, such as the GEOS portal in order to download uh, in a timely manner uh, data, uh, in situ data, such as entomological data, epidemiological data, socioeconomic data, but also earth observation, environmental and meteorological data. The data ingestion and pre-processing area of the system is uh, a suite of APIs that we have developed in, in order to, uh, or to um, ensure automatic data harvesting, data pre-processing, generation of the environmental indexes and conversion of the data in order to be in the right format to be uploaded into the open data cube and databases technologies. The big data management and data, data handling is uh, using advanced uh, and modern technologies such as open data cube and uh, databases, uh, including Postgres and uh, PostGIS. Uh, I have to tell you here that for the time being uh, and for the five uh, countries uh, involved, uh, we have uh, uh, ingested into the databases and the Open Data Cube uh, um, uh, tools of the system 278 terabytes of environmental, entomological, epidemiological data 
the victim information for the last 10 years. And uh, these uh, modern open data cube uh, technologies are uh, uh, so flexible that uh, uh, enable us to uh, retrieve and uh, process and analyze on the fly every bit of information in any slice of time and uh, space uh, over the, um, the, the, the five countries uh, uh, in, um, that are already I mean, that are the other study in uh, so far. Uh, this is the core part of the system. It is uh, there where we do analyze the data. We uh, derive uh, statistics and uh, trends out of the data. We correlate data. Uh, we, uh, and uh, of course, it is there that we uh, generate, uh, we do the so-called feature engineering, and we generate the appropriate features to be uh, used as the right input to the predictive models. And the models are two type models. The generic models, like the Mimesis generic model, which is a dynamic model used for human case risk prediction. And the Mammoth uh, data-driven generic model, which is, um, has been uh, used and validated over the five countries and used for uh, mosquito abundance prediction. But uh, apart from the generic models, and generic models, I have to tell you that, uh, as, as we said before already, they are uh, enabling us to transfer this uh, the implementation of the system in other countries. But apart from the generic models, we have also developed the so-called site-specific models, such as the bar and bud, also uh, uh, respectively used for human case risk prediction and mosquito abundance predictions. These are site-specific in terms that they have been developed uh, following the uh, specifications set uh, by the end user. Uh, for example, in the specific case by the prefecture of Central Macedonia in Greece. Uh, thus, uh, uh, requiring us to provide information in uh, an improved uh, uh, temporal and spatial resolution. But of course, you will hear uh, on all this in the next presentation given by, by our partners. The tier six is the so-called knowledge representation and explanation tier of the system. This is uh, where we transform the uh, data, uh, the analysis of the data and the results of the model into information that is useful and uh, readable uh, by the users, such as reports that we are providing on a systematic basis, big weekly or monthly basis to the end users. And because AOI is an open system, as we said, it uh, uses its own uh, web portal uh, a, a suite of web services are available there uh, for the benefit of the partners, the user, the general public uh, for uploading, downloading data or visualize, visualizing uh, uh, products and, uh, and, and uh, delivered services. And last but not least, this uh, web service is uh, empowered by the so-called EWA Open API. Uh, an API that can be used by open data hubs, such as the Nexus Data Hub, the Geos Portal, and other uh, repositories, data repositories, in order to harvest data uh, from EOA and make this data available to the, um, uh, to, the, to, the, to the general public and to the scientific community for further uh, research development. It is indeed that the next year's data hub uh, harvests today by the use of the EWA Open API analysis ready data for the last 10 years and uh, over the nine European regions that are um, engaged in um, and treated by and studied by the EWA system, information depicting environmental, meteorological, and geomorphological features from these uh, regions. EWA in action. In uh, 2020, actually, the system uh, uh, was uh, implemented on an operational basis in uh, four regions in Greece, Central Macedonia, Thessaly, Western Greece, and Crete, and the region of Veneto in Italy. And uh, it was also tested the system on a pre-operational uh, basis in order to uh, assess the mosquito abundance and predict and forecast the mosquito abundance uh, in Serbia, Germany, Italy, and France for different species of mosquitoes, such as Culex, Anopheles, and Aedes. In 2021, I have to, uh, to, to tell you that uh, the system will continue to be implemented in Greece, Italy, and Serbia this year in regard to the uh, human case risk. 
and it will be also implemented on an operational basis to forecast the mosquito risk in, uh, in all the five countries, uh, in the nine regions, uh, and uh, for all the different uh, uh, species of mosquito that are uh, in the interest of the local authorities. In a nutshell, uh, AOA is a system that uh, it, is, uh, it builds upon a plethora of satellite and in-situ observation data. It is using uh, in-situ collected uh, uh, and uh, histories of entomological, epidemiological, crowdsourced, socioeconomic, and auxiliary data, and integrates state-of-the-art technologies. I mentioned before open data cube technology, database technology, but also it has been developing and uh, testing and uh, validating and implementing uh, uh, data-driven mathematical uh, dynamic models for the prediction and forecasting of the risks. According to the feedback we have received from uh, our users, uh, this system is a uh, key lever for public health authorities and decision makers, supporting them in the preparedness and uh, the timely design of their strategies and uh, actions. And it is a system that uh, raises citizens' awareness on the expected risk uh, in view of uh, to fight mosquito-borne diseases. By this, I would like to thank you uh, very much for your uh, uh, kind of attendance and attention. And before I pass to the next uh, to the next uh, presenter, I would like to remind you that um, do not hesitate to pose your questions using our Q and A function. Uh, my colleagues will collect uh, these uh, questions and uh, we will uh, reply them uh, during the last session of the meeting. Uh, now I will um, you will give the um, floor to the next presenter, maybe with the support of my colleagues here, I will, <laughs> I will allow you to stop sharing, yes, stop and then... Yes, I did it already, thank you, thank you, Beth, thank you. <laughs> and turn on your cameras again. Yes, so we have invited, Aspiros is here and we are waiting for Yanis. Uh, hello, Spiros. Nice to see you. Hi. Um, I just, uh, while we are, oh, there's a feedback on the sound. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, we are waiting for Yanis. If uh, Yanis will have some trouble getting in, we will start with you first, uh, Spiros. Are you up for that? Now you muted yourself. Yes, okay. So, uh, Remember to ask questions uh, during the webinar, and as I wrote in the chat, write the name of your presenter in front of your question, so it's easier for us to collect your, your questions towards the end. Uh, we do have uh, planned a uh, stretch the leg, but I think since we have you here already, Spiros, I think we can go ahead and uh, listen to you. Um, there is some back noise is that are you logged in twice perhaps Piros? no no <laughs> okay i heard a, uh, twice, a, no. a, a female echo <laughs> yeah 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 no, we're together with sandra my colleague that's it that's okay it. so maybe sandra could you turn down the sound of your of the webinar because uh, we are hearing echoes it's probably because you're listening in so, um, so should, I, should, I spoke? should I speak now? Yes, if you can share your screen and start. Yeah. Uh, by the way, yes, we, you have noticed that you we post some polls during in the chat, and we appreciate you answer that. And uh, Haris or I will actually summarize the, your responses so you get to see um, how the you as an audience answered. So that that's uh, something look for to look forward to towards the end. Okay, Spiros. Yeah, but um, okay. yeah, okay, now we can do it. Yeah, right. So can you hear me? We hear you fine with, now. And we see echo, your presentation. With echo or without echo now? It's okay? When the sound is okay? Yes. Okay, no. okay, okay. so I will, uh, because Harris accuses me of uh, taking more time than I should, I have Sandra Giver in my, you know, here so that she will notice my, you know, uh, notice my, the, the right time. So I pass directly to uh, 
to the to my theme of uh, the presentation operational use of Ava in Greece so uh, actually mosquito control was finished uh, at the 60s in Greece uh, uh, during the uh, well uh, because Greece was declared malaria free and actually the re there was a restart in mosquito control 97 in central Macedonia uh, because of the presence of rice fields by us, by Eco Development. I will tell you who we are later on because I want to present, to make the presentation and I will present ourselves later on. Now, 2010, the game changed because we had WNV, an outbreak, it's, it's a very serious outbreak of uh, in central Macedonia. 35 dead people in one year in a plane, that's too much. And in and, and 2011, we had also the uh, the the resurgence of malaria autochthonous malaria cases in in Greece for the first time after the end of anti-malaria campaigns. So there were two phenomena quite important, and uh, from then on, uh, the last ten years, we had something like more than 1,200 WNV cases in all over the country, with 40% uh, of these in Central Macedonia, and we had something like uh, you know 100 autochthonous malaria cases. I think that, well, um, early warning system, in, in, in our case, the early warning system of AVA must, have be, must, must be based on four pillars, right? Risk knowledge, monitoring networks, response actions, and communication. Now, risk knowledge, of course, it's the, the academia, uh, and, but also operators doing a lot, are doing a lot, we are doing a lot of, of risk knowledge, uh, you know, uh, research. We have data science and we have earth observation technology now that are accessible and low cost. We try to construct models and uh, our self, uh, you know, um, uh, eco development is not just a mosquito control uh, company, but it's a data analytics. And these five years, we're constructing models on our data. And Central Macedonia is a very opportune place to do this, especially in West Nile virus, because it has a lot of epidemiological and entomological and mosquito control and ecological data. Now, the second pillar is monitoring networks. Now, these monitoring networks must be functional and should be functional actually by operators or by research institutes, right? Now, three uh, very basic mosquito networks we have to follow up. Uh, the one is, of course, the mosquitoes, I mean, larvae and adults, right? And then we have also the pathogen circulation that we have to follow up. And this is our mosquitoes, infected or not, sentinel chickens and human cases. Now, of course, we had uh, a lot of technology again in, to, to, to solve problems such as data streaming and, you know, model run. And, but in any case, the big thing is how we can incorporate these results in our response actions. So this is the third pillar, right? And here operators in collaboration with administration and here I would like to thank uh, people from Central Macedonia, but from the other regions as well, because without their help, without their collaboration, I think it's very difficult to make anything. So we have a transition now, very urgent transition to pass from responsive to preventive actions. And of course, we must protect dense and vulnerable populations in the urban environment. And of course, again, we have to have ongoing projects. Fourth and last pillar, uh, many times underestimated is the communication. And the communication, it's all the three major players that must do uh, communication. I mean, the administration, the academia, and the operators, right? And then we must explain to the people the difference un un between nuisance and risk. And of course, within the AVA, we did a lot of reporting for the predictions and a lot of the platform as well. And we need also this community involvement. I will give you one example per pillar. So the first pillar is risk knowledge. I just show you uh, the two uh, predictive, uh, predi I mean, models that we have constructed, the BAD, which as Harry showed a little bit, it's a site-specific data-driven predictive model for mosquito abundances at the bar, which is has the same characteristics, but it refers to human uh, risk, you know, uh, with uh, W and V. I won't, I won't get into that, just to mention that they are very, I would say, uh, high resolution, right? The, the BAD is talking about the settlement level per daily predictions, daily predictions, 
and we have been operating it in the four regions in Greece. And the bar is on the settlement level, uh, but weekly predictions and only for Central Macedonia. So the risk knowledge actually, it's you know, it's a series of, 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 of features, and it's very important to notice here for the bar if this is a scheme to present the feature importance uh, for this uh, prediction model. Uh, you can see uh, in in red, I have the Culex, which is actually the bad, the the uh, nested model within the bar model. The second is the Sentinels, which is the Sentinels that I'll show you on the next slide. And MIR is the uh, minimum infected infection rate for the probability, actually for the for the mosquito for the infected uh, uh, mosquitoes. And this is important because this is the type of information that we get, you know, um, from from our monitoring networks. So you have again mosquito larvae. In red, you will see the numbers that we'll be producing this year and from now on, hopefully, right? In 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 in, in uh, the numbers in black. Uh, they represent uh, what we have been built up uh, so far the last last ten years. So every year we're producing two hundred thousand inspections, digitized, you know, and uh, you know observations and measurements on larvae. It's big data. It's really big data. The second thing is mosquito adults. We produce one thousand five hundred samples per year, one thousand two hundred samples per year. You know, blood samples from sentinel chickens all over Greece and 1,500 samples analyzed for infected mosquitoes. And of course, we take into consideration the human cases through our collaborators, AUF, Aristotle University of Saloniki, uh, the Technological Institute of Crete, you know, and uh, AOV and uh, whoever, I mean, other. Right, so monitoring networks. The AVA, the impact of AVA was that when we start, this is an extended network of the sentiments, right? This is the early season and then, when there comes the new, let's say, uh, how say, predictions by the Mimesis model, the model of Yanis Kuchukis, who, who, who will present it, I, I suppose, late, later. I mean, we just focus on the most, let's say, high risk areas, which is actually Central Macedonia. And here you see the deployment of our two networks, the one with the traps of mosquitoes and the other one with the sentinels, which follow a little bit, you know, the colors uh, per municipality, the risk, the risky municipalities. And this is the deployment following the later season. I mean, August, September, October, following again the late season predictions of mimesis. Now, Response actions. Why, why, why do we do all this? I mean, to, to make uh, right decisions, right? So mainly larvae siding for prevention and mainly adult deciding for responsive, uh, for resp as, as a response, right? And then we have three three different systems, wetlands, rural areas, and peri-urban. And from, from, from 2010 and onwards, we focus more and more in the built environment. Why? Why? Because catch basins in the cities and cesspools in the villages are the the number one breeding sites for Kulex, which Kulex gives us, you know, West Nile virus. Response actions. Okay, the bar. The bar model uh, it w has been really operational during, uh, you know, last year. So bar week 32 proposes, us, suggests us, uh, 187 villages at risk. So what do we do? We intensify this peri-urban larvae siding around this 187 by 8.5 as compared to the villages without risk. And this is the communication. It's underestimated. Uh, we must do more about this. What we do is because we do door to door, you know, we distribute these leaflets in 30, 40,000 houses per year. This is a, an initiative we do with, with, with Central Macedonia. And Central Macedonia, actually, the region of Central Macedonia is also organizing four years, uh, four times a year. And this was the year, the AVA year. Uh, and, and here you see, for instance, in front of the AVA banner, you know, the governor of Central Macedonia. Uh, who is at the same time president of the European Committee of the Regions, uh, along with uh, his uh, uh, director in public health, Mr. Kurtidis. Here they are just, uh, you know, and this is very, very, very essential. Now, I finished up with the four, with the four examples of the four, let's say, pillars, right? How, how, how this, uh, how, how the AVA affected our, our, our activities, right? Now I will give you three case studies about how the, the, I think the impact is for the, it was already uh, very evident, uh, you know, uh, following the predictions of, uh, 
of, of, of whatever, of Ava and whatever. I mean, Mosquito Vision, this is an open smartphone application that we first launched, I mean, uh, this year. It is working now in 2,400 villages all over Greece, I mean, four different, you know, regions. Uh, we predict five nuisance classes, right? In evening and nighttime nuisance. Uh, it was a, a, a big hit, actually. Uh, we had 700 downloads in 2020. And the good thing was also that uh, we validated this, uh, this, this product. And of course, it is very important to, um, for you to understand that uh, uh, we uh, uh, had to validate this product, of course, because it is off track, you know, based on the, mod on, on the predictions on our network of traps, we try to predict uh, the abundances and therefore the, uh, okay, the nuisance, you know, off trap in 1,000 villages, right? So I have already covered 10 minutes, so I must go very fast for the next five minutes, right? So um, weekly validation of predictions in collaboration with 47 peers in 43 villages, 288 validations. So the average declination of felt to predicted nuisance level in the evening was 0 0.7 level. I remind here that we're talking about five different levels of nuisance, right? In the Kulix, uh, concerning the Kulix abundances. And at night, it's very nice. It's only 0 0.1 level. Now, impact two, it's the bar. Besides the routine mosquito control program, we need decision criteria for extra control actions against WNV. It's called door to door, right? But which village? I mean, we have 1,000 village and, and, and when? We have 20 at least critical weeks. So typical operational capacity, 10 to, to 20 villages per week. How do we do? Up to now, what we were doing, we were lo looking at the previous WMD cases. In 2020, in Central Macedonia, West Nile virus cases occurred in 65 out of the more than 1,000 villages that we have in, the, in this region. If we had the possibility to make door-to-door -door applications in 200 villages, that's the working hypothesis. And if decision for these villages with door-to-door -door applications were made based on, let's say, random selection, then 200 villages out of the 1,000, right? We have 220% of, of recall. That means we would, we would have captured 13 out of the 65 villages. The normal way we proceed is to take a look on the previous WMD cases, and that's the way that we characterize the high-risk villages versus the non-risk villages. So in this way, we would have 19 out of 65, but finally with the bar, bar suggestions, okay. we had four, excuse me? Yeah, and we had 34 out of the... Okay, so uh, we had actually with the bar suggestions... 34 out of the 65 villages by bar. So we had at least, I'd say, 15 up to 20 averted, you know, cases. I mean, averted villages with case, I mean, villages with averted cases, which is already very considerable. And as I will explain a little bit shortly here, we try to understand what is happening and how we can uh, uh, so increase the precision. Now, in real epidemiological settings, such as 28, uh, 2018 and 2020 in central, central Macedonia, there is no option of having control villages, right? We, th th there's no uh, alternative. So the only possibility is to construct robust predicted models and to simulate the contribution of important features such as the Kulix abundances, right? So the third most important feature of BAR, you don't remember perhaps, it was what I said 10 minutes late before, it, it, one of the most important features was the nested bud predictive model for abundance. So we have a very important interplay between bud, the prediction of the, you know, the prediction of the abundance of Kulix in within the villages and the bar and the actual, you know, prediction for, uh, for the West Nile virus. Since larvicide is the main mosquito control method, we are working now on linking larvae abundances, which are really big data, I repeat, we produce 200,000 inspections per year. That means 3 million values, 3 million observations, you know, actions. And uh, so, so, so this would be uh, ideal to relate larvae, adults, and the risk. Concluding remarks. Ava is the first example, at least to our knowledge, Sandra and myself, 
uh, for sure in Europe, perhaps in, in the other continents, of an operationally used early warning system with a balanced interaction between all four pillars of an early warning system, risk knowledge, monitoring networks, response actions, and communication. Along with our partners within AVA, we exploited open source and field data from 2010 and onwards, and we will keep on building the capacity to be more proactive, targeted, and efficient for the control of WNV and or other vector-borne diseases. AVA will hopefully increase its impact through the expected incorporation of the AVA predictions in the everyday decision-making of the European mosquito control operators. And finally, AVA contributes to a more comprehensive, interactive, and structured cooperation between the three, our three distinct worlds, okay? The administration, the research, and the operators. And this is something absolutely needed. I would like to thank, uh, of course, my team, of course, my teammate, uh, Sandra Guevere, my El Carago uh, scientific, who is the next, I mean, which is the next president of the EMCA, European Mosquito Control Association. Um, and of course, uh, the R&D uh, department, at Dr. Milto Siatru, Dr. Christos uh, Caridas, Dr. Xanthi Stella, uh, Xanthi uh, Cheni, uh, our data analyst, Yanis Picholas, of course, Stella Kalouts, Kalouts, team from the Mosquito Control Department. Now, um, we have also a consortium, the Early Warning System for Mosquito-Borne Diseases, all the people we have been working in from 2018 practically, and we just in, we, we've been integrated. Let's say we 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 offered ourselves, you know, in the in the AVA uh, initiative, and we're talking about professors uh, from from Greece, Anna Papa, uh, Chrysostomos Dovas, Eleni Katrangu, of course, our friend Norbert Becker, you know, from CAPS Germany, uh, you know, Jonas Schmidt, Tanazit, and uh, Renke Lunke Lunke from from the Berghanov Institute. And of course, last but not least, the regions of Central Macedonia, especially the region of Central Macedonia, Mr. Kurtidis, Mrs. Athangelidou, who are supporting us so many years to try to, to make, you know, uh, to, to, to make something useful for us and for everybody, Western Greece, Crete, and Thessaly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Firas. Um, and uh, I, yeah, can you unshare your screen? Yes, 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 I will. And since last, we also have Yanis here. So, um, uh, and uh, Harris, you will introduce Yanis. That's uh, that's your job. But I just want to say, I think we need to. Uh, we, uh, after Yanis, I suggest we take a five-minute leg stretch uh, because then it's a natural uh, trans uh, transition to talk more about Ava in Europe. So that's the next session. Okay. So, uh, Harris, please introduce Johannes. First of all, I would like to thank you for this nice presentation. And I would like also to thank all his team and all the colleagues from uh, Eco Development that uh, have done this excellent work uh, during the last uh, three years, of, almost three years that we have been collaborating. Uh, and especially for uh, the presentation of the prototype innovation that have uh, been achieved in the framework of AOA and the support that uh, Eco Development has provided uh, the daily practice of uh, the regional authorities in Central Macedonia, as well as in the other regions of Greece. Uh, yes, uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce the next speaker is uh, Professor Ioannis Kutsukis from the University of Patras, Laboratory of Atmospheric Physics. Uh, Ioannis um, has um, developed excellence in the domain of modeling, predictive modeling, and will demonstrate uh, the use of uh, the Mimesis dynamic and generic model as it is uh, introduced uh, by the AOA system for West Nile virus human based prediction in Greece and Italy. Ioannis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Harris. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this uh, webinar. Uh, Spiro, I'm sorry, if I don't think I put so much pressure on you by changing this uh, the order. Uh, there were some connection problems uh, we solved the last minute. Uh, I turn me. Oh. Yes, the problems. Uh, 
Do you need help with uh, the presentation? I think no. Maybe... I don't think I don't need help. I need one minute to uh, get in again because it's uh, you are in doesn't have access uh, to my uh, <clears throat> to my screen. I have yeah. to get, get in in one minute. No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it was too, have, uh, too quick there. Um, can I ask you, Katarina, do you have Yanni's presentation um, on your side just to have a big backup? Yes, okay. We will do it. We will uh, upload the presentation on the, on the system. So, Katarina, are you able to do it? All right. So, Yanis, don't worry about that. We will uh, handle the presentation. She's not in there. Oh, Yanis uh, is not there. All right. No, oh, Yanis, he was uh, too uh, too quick, and uh, he's asking for the floor again. So here he comes. Um, hopefully, he managed to get in easily this time. Um, let's see. Uh, meanwhile, I'll see since Spiros is still here. No, here comes Yanis. Okay, right. then. Then, uh, yes, on. Uh, Yanis, we will. Uh, uh, do we have the presentation of Yanis? We can. We can. We can. Can I? Hello. Hello, Yanis. We will. We will uh, play your presentation, Yanis. So don't worry. Will you just uh, uh, take the floor, and we will uh, change the slides for you. F harmonies one. one. You, still, you still cannot share your screen. No, no, no. It, it's it's okay. It's uh, it just shares only only one application. Can, can you see this now? Yes, yes we yes. can. Okay, it only shares the application and not the entire. Oh, there you are. Perfect, Yanis. Okay, you're good to go. You're good to go. <laughs> Thank you. Once more, I'm sorry for this. Uh, <clears throat> so, my talk is uh, reliability of early warning signals in West Nile virus predictions. Uh, let's start. <clears throat> uh, let's start with some facts. West Nile virus is climate dependent. Factors such as temperature and precipitation affect survival and reproduction rates of vectors and pathogens, influence the intensity of vector-borne pathogen transmission, and hence modify the probability of epidemics. In Europe, a substantial increase in West Nile virus infections among humans was observed during the period 2010-2020. Let's see first the regional pattern on the right. The maps show the areas where the West Nile virus is now endemic in Europe. It started in, 2000, in, in 2010, and this area is gradually expanding. The time series plot on the left demonstrates the evolution of the monthly number of infected humans in Europe since 2010. We can see here that an outbreak occurred in 2018. So, the spatial, the spatial pattern is gradually expanding. With, rega with regard regarding the temporal pattern, we see that more or less it's stable every year since it's endemic after 2010 and there is an outbreak in 2018. It was something different that year. At that year, at that year, <clears throat> all seasons were warmer than usual. Late spring, summer and autumn <coughs> have temperature anomalies more than one degree. So this is a qualitative index, early warning index. Uh, <clears throat> this is especially the uh, early spring temperatures. Let's move now to <coughs> finer scale, move to province or municipality scale left. There are the municip municipalities in Greece. 
uh, <clears throat> in Greece, we had two major outbreaks of the virus, one in 2010 and one in 2019. Geographically, the pattern shows that roughly half municipalities are infected. West Nile is endemic in half municipalities of Greece, with the same, <clears throat> the same uh, number of occurrences. Well, no, there are some municipalities in green, where, which means that only once in the last 11 years, the West Nile virus occurred in humans, and <clears throat> there is, on the other hand, with a, a red color, some municipalities where seven years in the last 11 we had outbreaks. This is the geographical pattern. The temporal pattern is below, which shows that <clears throat> there was, uh, in between two year 2015-2016, we didn't have any, any occurrence at all in Greece. And in the other years, the pattern is, uh, is varying every, every year. So, this climate change signal we saw before with the 2018 outbreak in Europe is not visible in Greece. If we see the region of Veneto on the right, there are seven provinces where <clears throat> out of the seven, only one never had any West Nile virus uh, uh, in humans uh, incidents, while in the others there were occurrences in, in six to nine years in the last 13 years. Unlike Greece, in Veneto region, the climate change signal is much more clear. So, <clears throat> it seems that just an indication of the spring temperature anomaly is not, uh, is not a global characteristic that we can use to make assessments about what will happen. It's a qualitative index that works in some areas, doesn't work in other areas. Something <coughs> that looks common, however, in both countries is that there is, in between 14 and 15, there is vi virus was human, hum human cases were minimized. So this is, <coughs> This is something uh, that it's still, uh, uh, we don't have the answer, but it seems that there are some cycles of the virus with uh, a period five to six years, uh, then it stops for some time and then it starts again. This is also, again, a qualitative index like the one I saw, I told before. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> We can make qualitative assessments based on indices like uh, the temperature anomalies or uh, the, the, how many years we have cycles of West Nile virus in a region. If we would like to make quantitative assessments uh, of the spatial and temporal variability, this is a major challenge and requires a causative attribution. Here I, here I show the two approaches we use in EWA. The first one, which I'm going to present here, is the uh, causality-driven model, which is called MIMS. The second one is the data-driven approach, uh, in, usually in, implemented mainly from uh, the colleagues at the National uh, Observatory of Athens and uh, in, at ECODEV. So I, I just mentioned here that this approach is also very, it, it, <clears throat> it's very important and relies, relies in uh, the existence of big data. The first one is causative. <clears throat> what I mean here by causative is that we know that the transmission and geographic distribution of West Nile virus is associated with the presence of both avian host and mosquito vector. So, the West Nile virus circulates between mosquitoes, birds, and humans are dead and hosts in this, uh, in this circulation. All this, <clears throat> this pattern is affected by environmental and socioeconomic uh, conditions, which can influence the viral persistence and the dynamics of outbreaks.
<clears throat> Here we implement the, the idea of developing a causal, a causal model relies on uh, the idea behind uh, uh, numerical weather prediction. In numerical weather prediction, as you know, uh, an evolution took place in the last 50 years where ensemble modeling transformed weather forecasting, delivering reliable predictions. This is what we would like to do also for West Nile virus. Uh, we aim to do. Okay. And I will present the point where uh, <clears throat> we have arrived so far. Differences with numerical weather prediction is that in, we in epidemics, we have limited, limited data for data assimilation. Limited data. This is one point. The second point is that uh, unlike numerical weather prediction, in epidemics, there are many non-physical processes that are important. And of course, these are problematic to parameterize and incorporate in a model. Just to, <clears throat> to stop with this uh, with slide, I, I will say that two important uh, elements of uncertainty in the West Nile Valley predictions have to do with the meteorological uncertainty and epidemiological uncertainty, which we both tackle in this, <coughs> in this, uh, in the mimesis framework. I will explain later how. The dynamical core of the AO, uh, AO system is the mimesis model, meaning that dynamical core that is not data driven. Okay, it's a causality driven model. So it relies, the core of the model is a sale, a sale model which has 14 compartments, uh, 14 health states for mosquitoes, birds, and humans. Uh, <clears throat> this model has 25 parameters optimized through uh, available data in the last decade. This model uses a <clears throat> an input uh, database of environmental, epidemiological, anthropological, geographical, and demographical data. And the model gives what? Gives uh, the larva and mosquito abundance, the infected mosquitoes, infected humans, the basic reproduction number, risk maps, uh, just to mention a few. So let's see how the model, what the model can achieve both in historical simulations as well as see what it did in the forecasting the 2020 uh, situation in Greece and the Veneto region. First of all, uh, I would like to set the, <clears throat> the threshold. How far can this model go? This is only, the mo this model uses only 14 equations <clears throat> to mimic to mimic the West Nile virus circulation between birds, mosquitoes, and humans. So it's a rather it's a simple model. There are many processes that are not there. With this simple model, how far can we go? Assuming that the meteorological uncertainty is, uh, is well defined, uh, we use the ECMWF seasonal forecast. So we assume that this is clearly represented in the model. What is the limiting predictable skill? Here, this is in quotes. If the epidemiological uncertainty was minimal, what does it mean? You know, in, when you have a, a system of differential equations, in other words, you have a system, <clears throat> an initial value problem. Meteorological uncertainty is tackled through the uh, ensemble, weather ensemble the, of uh, ECMWF. Epidemiological uncertainty requires some initial state. It's impossible to have, it's impossible to have uh, <clears throat> epidemiological measurements when we start uh, running the model every year around March. Th there aren't any. Okay, so I present here the epidemiological state of each year as it was optimized through the available data. The plot on the left, 
The left, uh, the C axis on the left shows the detection probability in the 325 municipalities of Greece and how this skill changed over the years. This skill was in, in 2010 roughly 90% of the municipalities where human cases were observed were identified by the model. Next year, this dropped to something more than 0.6. Generally, <coughs> you can see that this detection probability is over 60%, with an average of over 70% uh, over the decade. Last year, last year in Greece, the gross number was a little bit more than, zero, than 65%. In Italy, on the left chart, I uh, just remind that there are 325 municipalities. In Veneto region, we have seven provinces. What did the historic simulations show? They show that <clears throat> generally the detection probability, you see that it is 100% in all years except 2009 and 2020. In 2009, the detection probability was 50%, so half of them were identified, while last year it was 66%, two-thirds of them were identified. It's obvious that it's the same model, the same equations, but <coughs> the results vary between uh, the, two, uh, the two regions. There are another one million reasons to explain, uh, I, I will conclude with possible differences. So, <clears throat> the model, we don't expect something more than what those uh, lines on the left or the lines with the blue show here. We don't expect something more in forecast mode. Just to, <clears throat> to show you the results in uh, a geographical pattern of the results in 2019. If you remember, 2019 in Greece, in Greece, it was 80 percent the probability, the detection probability. Uh, okay, there are <coughs> some uh, municipalities here and there not uh, uh, not identified, and most of them were in Athens, around Athens. This is the case in 2000, uh, in Italy, for, in Veneto, 2019, all of them were identified. In 2020, two of them on the right will show what the model did. On the left, it is the observations. Last year, if you remember, I said that in 2020, the detection prob probability in Italy, in Veneto region, was 67%. Two of the three were identified. Let's move now, let's move now to forecasts, having in mind how far we can go. We use meteorological uncertainty, again, as it is described by the, by the ECMWF ensemble, seasonal ensemble forecast, and we consider here the first epidemiological scenario, which we say it's the best one, assuming that who have the minimal number, the minimum number of infected mosquitoes in the area. And this is <clears throat> as it was uh, seen in uh, the past measurements. Forecast issued in March in the region of Central Macedonia demonstrates that one, there is one municipality that even even under the best epidemiological scenario, considering only the meteorological uncertainty, says that <clears throat> we will have human cases in, uh, in this municipality. This forecast was issued in March. And as you can see on the top right, this municipality, <clears throat> human cases were observed in this municipality several months later. So, just one, if we calculate some statistics here, we say it's only 4% in the sense that 
26 municipalities had problem in, in the region last year, only one was identified. But in this scenario, epidemiological uncertainty, epidemiological scenario was the best according to the historic data. The second scenario is... Uh, sorry, Ioannis, um, we are running a little bit uh, out of time. Could you possibly speed up? Yes, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, you. yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> okay, I skip then this scenario and I'll go to the scenario where we developed also a tool, a model to deal with the epidemiological uncertainty. This sets the historical database and tries to see, according to the current uh, environmental situation, which one fits better in the historical uh, in the historical data fits better uh, in epidemiological sense, and we use that uh, that value for our forecast. In uh, th this is <clears throat> this is more or less what we delivered last year to the to the regions. Of course, it's a little bit improved since uh, we, we we always make improvements to the model. Hit rate is up to 66%, up to 66% in June. It was 62% in March, means that 66% of the municipalities which had problem were identified. However, However, there are other problems like false alarms and municipalities that were not identified. So this gross index, which call, is called a <clears throat> critical success index, considers also this. So in total, if we consider what it predicted well, what it missed, and also the false alarms, this index falls to 47%. In other areas, this is in Thessaly region, Heat rate was, was much higher than uh, in the region of Central Macedonia, but the critical success index was very low due to several false alarms in the area. Uh, and I go directly to the forecast of Italy, where in, in March we had heat rate was 33% because only one municipality was identified. The second one was false alarm. In June, as you see on the right, the second one was also identified, making the hit rate 60%. However, the critical success index was 50% because there was one false alarm and one miss. So, <clears throat> just <clears throat> to summarize. Qualitative early warning assessments in the time scale of months of the spatial and temporal variability of West Nile virus circulation in mosquitoes, birds, and humans is a major challenge and requires a causative attribution. The MIMESIS model, developed at the Laboratory of Atmospheric Physics, the University of Patras, operates spatially at the meso scale, temporally at the monthly to seasonal scale. It's a dynamic model nested in an ensemble framework to account for meteorological and epidemiological uncertainty. In terms of meteorological uncertainty, it is handled through the ensemble seasonal forecast. The epidemiological uncertainty relies on an ensemble model developed by us also for this purpose. Statistics of the model. The average detection probability is 72% in Greece, in historic simulations, and 94% in Veneto region in optimal sense, I mean in historic simulations. In forecast mode for 2020, it was between 66% and 83%. I saw the three <coughs> case, the case of region of Central Macedonia, Thessaly, and uh, Veneto region. May temperatures are found most critical in shaping the West Nile virus dynamics. This is the very the most important conclusions from this work. Processes not included so far. The existence and effectiveness of vector control problems. Uh, programs, sorry. Uh, here I mean that when when they find some <coughs> when they find some uh, sentinels, sentinels infected, 
Uh, the vector control uh, program is uh, <coughs> starts in that in that area is very and affect of course the results presented by our model. This this parameter is not incorporated in the results I've seen, I've shown. Migra <coughs> migratory routes of birds are not included. Assimilation with surveillance data, which are usually available after June, are not included. Uh, other skills like the local skill uh, at each municipality or uh, a province, ensemble weighting, the periodic cycles I saw in the second uh, slide, uh, population factions tailored to the data at each municipality are not, uh, are not optimized. We, we use some more generic functions. Uh, socioeconomic factors at its, uh, at its local area also are not identified. And of course, other, uh, any other subject scale processes. So there is a long, long way to go. This, this was just a, <clears throat> an attempt to mimic the the process used that is used successfully in numerical weather prediction to adapt this the process into the epidemics. Uh, here I stop and I would like also to thank uh, my colleagues uh, uh, <coughs> and my team for who, is, who supported this uh, work, uh, especially Anastasia Angelou and Aratipa Papa. Thank you very much and I'm terribly sorry for the problems with my connections and how, I don't know how much time. Yes, <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Yanis. Thank if, you. If I, if I talked more than Spiros, then I should do something. We, we can, we have the recording, so we will see. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so now it is definitely time for us to take a break. A very, very interesting and uh, full of content uh, talks from all of you. Thank you so much. I will uh, temporarily give you so some floors from, uh, from Norway. This is a spring floor uh, before arriving before the mosquitoes. Um, but before... Uh, before we enter to the next session, uh, session of this webinar, I think we all could do with a stretch of the legs. So, um, and so we say we take a five minute break. So 1540, we will be back here. And when you come back, you will get a special greeting from a local politician in, um, in Greece. So wait to hear a greeting from, uh, from this politician. Um, it will be uh, given at uh, 15.40. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bede. So we'll come in five minutes. And uh, the politician is the governor of the prefecture of Attica. So we will say a few words about the, the, the action. Thank yes. you. Keep... So please come back, take a stretch, um, stretch your legs, and come back here um, in five minutes. See you. See you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bente, Bente, can you hear me? Hi, Dosa. Uh, is am I going to start and then I will be interrupted by a politician or what is the plan? No, no, Dosan. Hello, Dosan. No, you are not being interrupted. It's a written note that uh, will be read uh, by us uh, before you start, and then you will uh, give the floor to you to continue with your presentation. Don't worry. Excellent. No, I need It's like three minutes long speech. No words. Not. It will not. Three minutes. Three minute, yeah. uh, written speech. Not, uh, no, nothing more than this. Okay.
are back with sound also. <laughs> um, hello, Dizan. I see you uh, have joined us. And I also uh, think Daniel is here. Hello, Benta. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Yeah, hello. Hi, Daniel. Hello. So we, I guess we are waiting for Haris. Yeah. Yes, Haris, there you are. And Katarina is also here still. And uh, I think we can, uh, before we start with you, uh, Daniel and Dusan, and then um, Garrett, no, uh, what's his name? Gregory, sorry. Uh, afterwards, uh, we have this message from um, a local Greek politician. And we will learn more about that. Mirka, I yes. understand you're the voice of this politician. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, we have the pleasure to read the written note of the governor of the region of Attica, as his political engagement uh, prevented him from being with us today. So, uh, his speech. I quote, Dear friends, distinguished representatives of the National Observatory of Athens and the Beyond and Earth Observation and Satellite Remote Sensing Research Center Beyond, selected guests of the pioneering and important for public health conference. I salute the works of this conference. And once again, I express my respect for the high level of services, research and knowledge that the research center of the National Observatory of Athens Beyond represents providing its research tools in the service of life, health and public health with a focus on disaster prevention. The idea in the history of public health of predicting and preventing epidemics by looking at a satellite from above is unprecedented in most countries. And it is an honor for the advantages of Greece's scientific potential. The fact that already four countries from Europe have adopted the research program AVA, Honorable Professor Dr. Contoes and esteemed AVA collaborators. An initiative which comes from the future and inaugurates the new era in the management of public health crisis and in the discoveries that the avant-garde preserves for the years to come. Greece has gone since 2010 to date through epidemic outbreaks of high intensity of the West Nile epidemic with many hundreds of human casualties, a disease that has no vaccine or treatment and which can end up nightmarish or even fatal during, during the summer months in our country for local population and tourists visiting the Greek islands and the countryside. There is only, as a weapon of public health against West Nile virus, the systematic compliance of the prevention measures which can protect us from infections in the community and individually. From the first day of our duties in the Attica region, we mobilized with ground forces a dynamic vigilance program to deal with the epidemic. And indeed, with our timely interventions, we have dramatically reduced the cases. Now, however, with this special research program, Professor Contoes and esteemed AVA collaborators, you also provide to the international community the early warning for the West Nile virus epidemic as you personally created and uh, innovatively introduced, introduced it as a powerful tool. Our cooperation with the National Observatory has already officially started this year with the signing of a tripartite program agreement with the Attica region and the National Kapodistrian University of Athens for the elaboration of the program Natural Disaster Risk Assessment for the strengthening of civil protection of the citizens with that of Attica from earthquake, fire and floods, in which program that we together implement the central axis in the creation of, the, of, of a geo-information system hosted by the servers of the Beyond Earth Observation Research Center and Satellite Remote Sensing. It is news and a pioneering intervention in the management of global public health and safety, the project to monitor the advent of an epidemic such as West Nile virus epidemic through the environmental conditions that can be used to identify the areas most at risk using geographic information systems, remote sensing data, ecological variables and other spatial analysis technique, techniques. This approach, after all, is valuable in predicting the occurrence of other vector-borne diseases 
such as Lyme disease and malaria. So with great interest, I am looking forward to get the feedback from the outcome of today's event. Let me also express my wishes for the elaboration of the pioneering program in the four regions of the country, and I will be happy to immediately discuss our cooperation for its utilization in the largest metropolitan region of Greece, the region of Africa. I wish you good health to all participants and a quick way out of the pandemic crisis in every country. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this initiative. George Patoulis, Governor of Attica Region. Okay, thank you, Mirka. Uh, and uh, the Governor of Attica, uh, it is indeed that we have established a very close collaboration with the Prefecture of Attica and uh, the AOA system and the mosquito uh, uh, borne disease issue is something that uh, they have shown strong interest uh, and uh, we will continue uh, a, a, a exchanging with the governor towards the implementation and uh, the implementation of the system into the prefecture of Patica being one of the uh, uh, one additional region uh, uh, to be tested and to be I mean uh, involved into the into the activity into the action of EWA. Now let's uh, continue with the EWA presentations and uh, the next speaker is um, Dr. Dusan Petrix from the University of Novisad, Faculty of Agriculture, Medical and Veterinary Entomology, who uh, is going to present the vector control strategies against West Nile virus infection in Serbia. Dusan, uh, nice to see you and uh, many thanks for uh, your participation. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Harris, for inviting me. Thank you, all participants, for listening. And now I'm I will switch my camera off and start my presentation. Okay. Yes. Fine. So, uh, my presentation actually I put the, as a co-authors co only the leaders of the group, groups which are collaborating for more than 10 years on the West Nile research in in Serbia, and of course, there are many other my colleagues and technicians who contributed to uh, the results we obtained. So the rapid uh, spread of uh, West Nile virus in USA at the beginning of this century raised our attention. And in 2003, uh, we asked our colleagues, uh, climatologists, meteorologists, to compare the climates of the of the Bucharest region, which had the first big uh, European human case outbreak, the Central Valley of Ca California, which was most affected in USA, and uh, our region, it is North Serbia, province Vojvodina. And when they did comparison, we saw that the climate is very similar between these three places. So we decided to start doing something. And uh, in 2005, we, get, uh, we got the first project and started with to search uh, for vi virus uh, in uh, mosquitoes and humans. Then from 2007, we spread the search to horses and birds. Uh, during this time, uh, we interviewed uh, 450 randomly chosen inhabitants of Novi Sad about using protective measures against mosquitoes and found that in the group that uses repellents and window screens, prevalence was uh, West Nile virus IgG prevalence was much lower than in a group that they are not using these pre uh, preventive measures. In 2009, we found the, the first positive horse uh, to West Nile virus in Serbia. So before 2009, there was no any detection of West Nile virus circulation in vector or host. So in 2009, we found the first horse infected. In 2010, first mosquito, Culex pipiens, positive to West Nile virus. And in, uh, uh, in 2012, wild, first positive wild birds. So, uh, as uh, Nicolas uh, also indicated in his presentation, the surveillance or monitoring of uh, mosquito vectors is very important. 
and uh, we we are lucky to be able to do mosquito monitoring uh, or surveillance since uh, 1985, which provided us uh, uh, enough data to uh, depict changes in relations in this system. And I will present you only three examples of uh, this. The first one concerns the uh, po potential malaria vector Anopheles fricanus, uh, and uh, we correlated the spread and the increase in densities of this species over the period from um, from two, one, uh, uh, 1980, uh, 1985 and uh, with the trend of rising mean annual temperature which was at that time for, for this period about 0.8 uh, degrees centigrade. And we found that those two uh, uh, variables uh, were connected and that uh, this uh, potential vector increased both in space and the density in Vojvodina. Also, uh, at the next slide, uh, we uh, followed the correlation between average vector index, which uh, includes Culex pipians density and infectious rate, and the number of neuroinvasive neuro uh, West Nile disease cases in Serbia, and we found quite good fit, very, very high, high correlation. And we also, uh, uh, we also uh, looked, oh, sorry. We also looked at the uh, dependence of, on frequencies of frequencies of uh, West Nile virus uh, of positive Kulik PPS detection uh, on over uh, on overwintering microclimate. The microclimate uh, was defined by five by five kilometers, and temperatures averages from uh, October to April, and uh, we found uh, that for an increase of uh, 0 0.5 uh, centigrade in this period, a twofold increase in the incidence of West Nile uh, positive uh, Culex pipians could be projected. So, uh, based on these results, Veterinary Directorate. Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Water and Water Management, uh, Forestry and Water Manage Management in Serbia uh, appreciated these and other results we achieved during 10 years of when West Nile virus research and designed the surveillance program based on them. Also, the crop program uh, is uh, uh, up upgraded every year after the uh, results of entomological animal and human data which are used for analysis of risk and uh, other things to improve the system. Then, this surveillance program uh, showed quite uh, good uh, uh, performance in area of uh, specific, in area specificity, sensitivity and early detection capacity. Uh, mosquito samples were able to predict the uh, onset of uh, hum in human uh, circulation in humans 14 to 58 days before. Uh, sentinel chicken, but we use it only for one year, 25 days. Wild birds, 5 to 35 days. And the horses, 3 to 30 days. And after all of this, uh, we uh, actually uh, realized that uh, we are missing the action after so-called surveillance program, and this action would be uh, vector control. And this is uh, uh, the uh, this uh, on this slide you can see the impact of uh, 117 ground ULV treatments on adult Culex pipians mosquitoes. Above x-axis is a relative uh, reduction, below relative increase of population size one day after the treatment. So, increase 
uh, was observed in 21 out of 117 treatments. Uh, average reduction was uh, uh, 45, uh, almost 46 percent without calculating increase. And when increase is included, included in calculation, the reduction is as low as 30 percent. So on the next slide, I will show you how it influences the seasonal, seasonal dynamic and density of Culex pipiens. And here you can see the data, uh, what we collected uh, uh, as a number of mosquitoes per trap per night. And mosquitoes are sampled every day from beginning of February to end of December at the suburban place protected by routine treatments. Aerial and ground uh, treatments are indicated by red hours and uh, larvae were treated from June to September at bi-weekly or monthly intervals. And from this uh, slide, I could not see the significant impact. So this happens in Serbia. If we go uh, wider and compare the situation in uh, France, Italy, Greece, and Serbia, where Culex pipiens uh, data coll are collected over 34 years of sampling at heavily treated, moderately treated, and untreated areas, we found no significant imp impacts of the treatments on vector density and seasonality. I have to say that for the Greece, we did not analyze the Spiros data. So, sorry, Spiros. So, is it possible to control Culex pipians at all? If, I don't know actually yet, but if someone asked me what will be the most successful mosquito control campaigns I know, I will answer malaria and yellow fever eradication during Panama Channel construction and eradication of malaria in Italy. So, both of these actions were performed in military way with not very sophisticated equipment, as you can see. But both were guided by scientists. Uh, so, this was responsible in Panama, and uh, at that time, maybe the, the leaders in the of malaria, Toto Superiore Sanità in Rome, were also very uh, led by Mussolini. And Do so? Do so? Yes. Sorry, but um, are you about to finish? Because I think. I want the... One more slide, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, the Colonel Gorgas and uh, Marshal Mussolini are not here to help us, but we can learn from their uh, examples. And I will say the, the governmental support is uh, beginning of the problem sol solution, and it should be regional. And then uh, the guidance should be local then we need of course good organization and coordination and then to predict where to go to survey because the cost of surveillance is not is not uh, low and also the education is of the citizens is fundamental uh, to success so what we like to do next is that we would like to continue with uh, multi-source data collection, uh, meteorological, entomological, epidemiological collection at the site of, uh, uh, of the area we are working at. And uh, also, uh, we would like to evaluate uh, the risk and adjusting the surveillance by AVA outputs at the municipality level, which is already said by Yannis, mid-scale level, mesoscale level. We would like. We would also like to include uh, LoRa Internet of Things network for data collection in the system, <laughs> microscale modeling of vector population dynamics and control to reduce West Nile virus transmission by 
using these models, which could be tailored then for uh, for timing and frequency of existing vector control tools to enhance impact. And of, of, uh, at the end, we would like to develop uh, uh, the, the, the model at the, and the web publication which could visualize the impact and estimate the cost of the Vesna virus control measures. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Luzan. Uh, we are running out of time. As you can tell, we should have been starting the um, uh, the Q and A by now. So I hope that you will be able to uh, stay with us uh, a little bit beyond the time. Um, right now, we are going to invite um, Daniel to uh, give his example, and then we have uh, Gregory's uh, recorded, so you will hear, hear that, and that will be 10 minutes. So I, I uh, kindly ask you to uh, try to stay to the time limit, if possible, even uh, reduce the time. It, uh, I leave it to you. Um, if if uh, you have so many uh, great presentations here, uh, we will kindly ask you to make these presentations uh, available uh, afterwards um, mm -hmm. and, in, and uh, available also together with the uh, the recording of this webinar. So just so, so you know that. And um, yeah, we will hear more about politics after some two more examples. So I think, uh, Daniel, I will give the floor to you. Would, uh, sorry, Harris, you will introduce Daniel properly. Sorry for that. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, and I have a pleasure, of course, to introduce Daniel Rebot Gerdmuth uh, from German uh, Mosquito Control Association. Uh, actually, Daniel is presenting uh, about the West Nile virus threat. Uh, what does this mean for Germany? And uh, which framework of needs paved the ground for the implementation of an early warning system like AWA today uh, by CAPS in Germany towards the targeted monitoring and uh, vector control. Daniel, uh, thank you for uh, your availability and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to share the screen. There we go. Can you see and hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, also, I'd like to mention that I speak uh, on behalf of Dirk Reichler, who is the scientific director of CUPS and who could not make it today because of a long-awaited medical appointment. And um, yes, I'll introduce CUPS quickly. It's a non-profit mosquito control association that was founded in 1976. And um, the over 90 members of CUPS are actually the local municipalities uh, along the Upper Rhine here in the southwest corner of Germany, um, which largely came together for nuisance control because after flooding of the river, um, there's usually a mass development of flood water mosquitoes in the riparian forest. And um, this nuisance uh, is very strong and that did restrict the life of the local people um, strongly. So initially any means to fight back uh, was used, uh, for example here uh, the fogging of fennet carp, which is an insecticide uh, which basically killed everything in the forest there. So luckily um, in close time to the foundation of CUPS also BTI was discovered and CUPS uh, with Norbert Becker and Paul Schädler uh, together with the University of Heidelberg uh, were also important as pioneers to uh, push forward the use of BTI as an environmentally friendly control agent so that we can now control this nuisance also in a larger scale without harming the environment. But in recent years, a new challenge has come up, which is vector control, because we do have uh, Aedes albopictus and West Nile virus now also in Germany. Aedes albopictus was first detected in 2007. I think it was X that were first discovered. And um, this initiated um, a series of research projects via the GFS, which is a, a closely related research association uh, to CUPS. And um, these research projects um, have led to the development of a control strategy that was also adapted to the situation in Germany, where we usually have um, 
uh, individual populations uh, that can be targeted. And um, this control strategy has then, um, since 2015, um, been applied more in an organized manner as well. Um, however, nevertheless, um, pop new populations have shown up and it has, uh, Aedes albopictus has spread further, so that in 2020, uh, in this southwestern corner here of Germany and the bordering countries, um, there were more than 20 populations of Aedes uh, albopictus. So also CAPS has uh, created a, far, yeah, a working group um, dealing with these exotic mosquitoes uh, under the head of uh, Arthur Joost and of course the team around him to deal with that. Um, then we also have West Nile virus in Germany since 2018. Um, which has successfully overwintered and established. So 2019, it came to a small epidemic here in Eastern Germany. Um, and as we can see on the ECDC map here, it has also uh, continued to spread further towards the Netherlands here in 2020. And um, in this recently published study by Siegler et al., um, they use a simple risk model based on the extrinsic incubation period, which largely depends on the temperature. And we can see that uh, this matches very well um, with the actual uh, yeah, uh, establishment or um, cases of uh, West Nile virus in birds, horses, humans, mosquitoes. Um, but what we can also see here in this uh, model is that the area here in the uh, Upper Rhine Valley, where we as CUPS uh, are active, is also a suitable area um, for West Nile virus circulation. So it does make sense to also um, implement some kind of early warning or monitoring system in this area here. So how can we as CUPS contribute uh, to the AVA system. First, uh, we can deliver entomological data, uh, which we collect um, also alongside our um, mosquito control operations since 1991 at up to 55 sampling locations along uh, the Rhine River here. Uh, which are sampled regularly during the mosquito season. And this data um, can hopefully help to validate those models and adapt those models also for Germany. Furthermore, um, it would also be in, or we would also be interested in the fut future to um, also screen the mosquitoes we collect for West Nile virus. Uh, we are currently investigating that uh, if, if we can upgrade our labs to actually do this, uh, to have this data also quickly available during the season. And furthermore, it would also be good to extend our monitoring network because this was aimed at uh, yeah, measuring how good the nuisance control works. So these trap sites are largely close to the natural wetlands. Um, but in a previous research project that was uh, conducted again uh, via GFS uh, together with Norbert Becker and also the Bernhard Nocht Institute and uh, our Greek project partners from, partners from Eco Development and University of Thessaloniki, uh, where we did extend uh, such yeah this, this trap network a little bit further towards the uh, rural and urban areas as well. Uh, and sent then the mosquitoes to the Bernhard Nocht Institute for screening, and we could detect uh, Usuto virus, which is very similar uh, to West Nile virus, um, in, in multiple locations, um, but also in different mosquito species. But um, yeah, such a monitoring network uh, does cost a lot of resources, and uh, we are a bit limited by that. And this is where we could really implement the predictive risk models uh, from AVA, because if we know where the risk is highest for West Nile, West Nile virus circulation, we could then uh, yeah, have a more targeted monitoring in just these areas. And as we saw uh, from the example in Italy, where it was already op operational, this would be useful on the level of municipalities. Or even better, like in the example from Greece, um, if uh, get the data on a higher resolution on the level of settlements, or as another suggestion on a, a level of a five kilometer grid, which would probably for our operational purposes be the most useful if you can uh, identify the high risk grids and then um, yeah, implement our monitoring in these uh, areas specifically. Um, but um, yeah, even beyond these predictive risk models, uh, I think there's 
more or how we can, because it might probably still take some work until those are properly adapted and give reliable results for Germany as well, as the conditions here are quite different from Southern Europe as well. But I think the database itself, this is a screenshot from the EBA uh, platform with our demonstration login that we got. Um, I think using this as a database to directly and quickly share data during the mosquito season would already be really helpful uh, also on an operational level. So we see here that, for example, we have the Culex data from CUPS in here already. But in the future, if we're also able to screen for arboviruses, we could have this data here as well. Or and the Bernhard Nocht Institute is already for many years doing a monitoring of uh, wild birds or dead birds uh, that get sent in. So if this data could be added here as well, that would add even more information during the season. Or if the public health uh, authorities could be involved and maybe add some data also on human cases, for example, also for imported tropical diseases such as dengue uh, virus and uh, we could then also add our Aedes albopictus data, which we also collect um, during our control operations for Aedes albopictus. Then uh, I think if this all comes together, it would just be a huge benefit for everyone involved. And furthermore, it is also going across borders, which is also an important aspect because mosquitoes and viruses don't just stop here at the border between France and Germany. So, um, yeah, this is, I think, a way how we could directly benefit from this database, this shared database. And as a final remark, I would like to add that it would be nice, of course, to implement a, a large monitoring everywhere, but we are limited by resources and, and also, in a way, by political decisions in some cases. And given that um, the members of, of CUPS are actually the municipalities. Uh, yeah, this is also true for CUPS. These are also political decisions sometimes. So I think uh, first that AVA could provide a strong concept and also the database tools to, to guide such decision-making processes. But maybe even more important, the potential for collaboration that comes with AVA and uh, the network behind it might help to add a bit more weight behind uh, any arguments that are for the implementation of such an early warning or monitoring system. And um, this also uh, would then lead me uh, to the question that you might have seen in the poll on the site in the chat. Um, if you think that, yeah, this the AVA consortium could also help your organization institution in your country to overcome any potential political uh, yeah, difficulties with the implementation of such an uh, early warning system that does cost resources to be invested in that. So with this, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. That was actually, this will be a very nice segue to the slight change we have to do uh, in the program uh, because uh, Olympia well, uh, I have some appointments she really needs to make. So that's why we are changing uh, the program a little bit. So um, you will hear uh, Gregory and Jonas after Olympia. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. It's very interesting and a nice segue to, uh, to, more, uh, to more discussions on the political level here. Uh, okay. Yes. So, uh, and I believe, Harris, you want to introduce uh, Olympia for us. Um, yes, thank you, thank you. Very first, I would like to thank uh, Daniel for this uh, excellent presentation. And uh, I will uh, just uh, wanted to underline uh, some few words of the presentation of Daniel. First, the possibility of uh, having in timely manner predictions of uh, uh, collect mosquitoes. Uh, uh, that is uh, actually the uh, implementation of AWA this year in Germany. They have been all the models pre-operational validated the last year. So this year it is to be given on an operational basis and the, on, the, on a monthly basis, the prediction of mosquito uh, of mosquito abundance and also the, the keyword of network. And uh, the network is, I think, the important key feature of, uh, of uh, AWA um, uh, action group. Now, yes, of course, I have to introduce uh, Olympia in the reality. We have uh, considered to plan to actually Olympia to give the concluding remark, but I know she has some another obligation. So I think, yes, yes, Olympia, please 
take the floor because for us it's very important to know what are the uh, the, the views of the European Commission and uh, the Directorate General for European Safety Protection and Humanitarian Aid towards uh, this crisis type of crisis management relating to uh, vector-borne diseases. Uh, so, Olivia, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Dr. Kantos and everybody, thank you for this invitation. I'm really um, pleased to be invited because I consider this uh, work uh, that you are doing all uh, quite important and relevant uh, because uh, the health sector as such is becoming uh, something uh, uh, a priority, as you all know, in particular, unfortunately, after the COVID pandemic, and uh, um, and therefore we are looking with uh, much interest to the work that we that you are doing. Um, I will speak, uh, and I will try to share. Um, in theory, I have been very well trained by <laughs> by colleagues. Um, I hope, uh, do you see my, can I ask you if you see my presentation? We see it, but it's not in presentation mode, Olympia. Can you click on okay. presentation mode and then the hide button there? Is uh, it, is it now hide? Yes. Perfect. Go ahead. <laughs> Super. Thank you so much. <laughs> for guiding me through this. Uh, yes, and I was saying this, that for me it is very important uh, the discussion we had so far and uh, the development that uh, has been done in the to build uh, the AWA system, um, tackling a big uh, and important, uh, um, I would say, uh, risk that uh, might even increase in the future. Um, what is important for me to tell you now is how uh, we um, consider early warning system, what are early warning system at European level, and um, so the policy framework, and also how we use them, what we have and what we don't have yet. So, and this might be interesting for you indeed. So my presentation, I will give you a little bit of an overview of what is the Union Civil Protection Mechanism, uh, explaining to you the mandate of the Commission on Early Warning System, uh, give you a short overview of how the Emergency Response Coordination Center and the Situational Awareness Sectors are working in case of emergencies, and uh, I will also uh, give you a short overview of some tools, uh, not only tools, networks that are supporting us with scientific uh, input and advice. So, as you might know, the Union Civil Protection Mechanism is a reinforced cooperation between the civil protection authorities of the EU member states plus six other others participating states, and it covers prevention, preparedness, and response. On prevention, we are speaking mainly of risk assessment, risk, um, risk mapping also of the capacity to uh, deal with the risk. Uh, preparedness is training exercise, early warning system, and here I will, I will focus on it, and then I will also explain how early warning systems are related to the response, which entails deployment of assets and experts, logistics uh, and logistics. As you might know, the Union Civil Protection Mechanism has been just reinforced uh, heavily, by the way, uh, because nowadays, um, um, in particular, due to the COVID situation, we have seen that the mechanism need uh, more to uh, be able to respond to such uh, overwhelming situations. And indeed, the new uh, mechanism is uh, providing with uh, the, the European Union with a rescue capacity, which will be a capacity uh, uh, managed managed by the Commission, mainly as mainly assets to support member states in case of need as safety net. 
and the new legislation is uh, also tackling in a much more um, deep way prevention uh, indeed and uh, in, in line with uh, the <clears throat> resilience goal and um, so it it is becoming really a disaster risk management uh, policy which was transforming it from an emergency uh, from a pure emergency management policy to a more disaster risk management policy so it's a big it's a change uh, in in that respect uh, regarding the early warning system as you know um, it's a very sensitive part of an emergency management or disaster risk management cycle, I would say, and it's member states' responsibility, the whole process. In particular, the alert to population is really a responsibility of member states. However, we, the Commission has a mandate to develop a, a European, I call it like that, European early warning system, which... Uh, would support, in particular, the Emergency Response Coordination Center. Sorry, uh, the Emergency Response Coordination Center to perform its own task. The Emergency Response Coordination Center is uh, is uh, uh, the heart, the operational heart of the mechanism. And I will speak after having shown you which are the tool. Uh, I call it tool um, that we call also European Early Warning System um, that have been developed in the framework of the mechanism and that are currently uh, transferred to Copernicus Emergency Management Service and with whom we work closely, as you might know, DGECO, um, uh, through the mechanism and not only is contributing um, to Copernicus Emergency Management Service. Um, so the, the main early warning system are for forest fires, floods and drought. We have also developed a different system through a different, um, we, uh, through a, one of the a call for proposals that uh, the, 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 the mechanism is uh, launching on an annual basis, which is Meteo Alarm. Meteo Alarm is based on the partnership called UMETNET, um, composed of the most relevant uh, meteorological institute in Europe. I think there are more than 30 institutes composing Meteo Alarm. You might know this this system uh, here there are just a, 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 a list they are all part of uh, a, a, no not all sorry except the metal alarm uh, EFAS, EFIS and IDO which has also a global company or part of the Copernicus emergency management service and they have been announced thanks to the inclusion of space technology and space Space technology, of course. The other big uh, system that for us it's quite important is a multi-hazard system, automatic, of course, and is the Global Disaster Alert Coordination System. And we are trying to, uh, in the last years, to include the EFAS, EFIS, and EDO. If uh, the, so, the forest fires, drought, and uh, uh, um, system into the GDAX in order to have a platform. What is important to understand of those system, and that is something also that it's important maybe for when when thinking to AWA, um, is the fact that uh, it's not only monitoring the hazard, but those system are allow are providing also the information of and hazard that is overwhelming the capacity of a country to be um, of, uh, to be handled. So um, when I see a red alert in GDAX, it 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 it, it yeah, sorry it um, 
it's a, I don't I don't find the word. <laughs> it's a, it, uh, it means sorry. It means uh, that um, that the, the the country might request for assistance for international assistance. That the hazard itself it's too big to be handled at national level. That is an important element to be considered when this when developing an early warning system for epidemics, for epidemics or, uh, as AWA, for example. So the emergency response coordination or using those early warning system is using this early warning system on a 24 seven monitoring. And of course, this is due also to the task of the ERCC to inform the participating states of the mechanism of the so-called Union Civil Protection Mechanism, and um, it, and when it comes to an emergency, the the ERCC has to coordinate the uh, the response effort coming from the member states composing the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. How the mechanism is activated during emergencies? We need to receive a request for assistance from any countries affected in, in Europe or outside Europe uh, being affected by a major disasters. So we receive a request for assistance and only after this we can activate the mechanism, uh, which means that the member states will offer assistance. We will get in close contact with the affected country and we will seek for um, the acceptance of the offer and then deploy, supporting the logistics, um, the assistance into the affected countries, always coordinating with the uh, affected government uh, in charge of uh, uh, the response. So this is a little bit in a nutshell, how it works, the response within the Union Civil Protection Mechanism uh, framework. Uh, in this moment, in, in, in this moment, and in particular at the beginning of an emergency, within the 48 hours, I call it, depending on the hazard, but let's put it uh, in between, before and immediately after, information are very few and very little. So the Emergency Response Coordination Center, in order to coordinate and to inform um, uh, immediately the, the, uh, the, the, the main, uh, the, the EU member states and the participating states, need reliable information, reliable and timely. For this, uh, it has been established the situational awareness sector from where I come from and where um, and, uh, and uh, we are uh, supporting the, in particular, the emergency response coordination center in uh, trying to uh, build uh, the best picture possible before or immediately after an event when the, uh, the information uh, are rare. It looks weird that they are rare, but the reliable and, um, and um, reliable and authoritative information are rare indeed within the 48, 48 hours. And here you could see how we work. Uh, this explain a little bit better how we work during an emergency situational awareness and uh, and the ERCC together. And you could see that our early warning system have been built to support that system because they are one of the main input, one of the main input of... Yes. Very yes. sorry to interrupt you, but... Um, I, I think we are we are already <laughs> yeah. very long overdue. So, do you think you can uh, wrap it up uh, a little yes. bit quickly? Because you also need to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yes. yeah, indeed. Thank okay. you, Olivia. Sorry for that, but yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. 
Well, uh, I think, yeah, as, you, as usual, it takes a little bit longer than, than uh, what we do. But anyway, I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. Uh, the early warning system are used, uh, therefore, to uh, our input, our uh, relevant input for us. Not only the early warning system, but also so the rap map of Copernicus, together with the scientific advice uh, that we have from uh, the 18 um, scientific institutes coming from 13 member states that are composing the European Natural Hazard Scientific Partnership, which is providing a 24-7 scientific advice. Now, to wrap up in this, this is maybe the slide, if you could see, that really gives you an operational overview on how the early warning system are embedded in the European emergency management system through the situational awareness sector, which here I call it analytical team. And we provide the maps, situational analysis and deployment plan. Now, we are quite, uh, uh, quite uh, well established for everything that is uh, uh, related to natural hazard. But of course, there are new risks and new threats. Uh, and uh, we are happy to see that, and we are exploring the, the how, how we can enhance that. And I think AWA uh, is a good uh, start and it could, uh, could, uh, could be, and we, we, look at, and we look at it in, uh, with uh, great interest indeed. That's why I'm here. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I would really, say that what we need in terms of DG ECHO and in particular the ERCC is really something that allowed to us also to understand the capacity of a countries to handle a hazard. So to follow an impact approach. I know that is very difficult to do this. I, I realize this also for natural hazard it's difficult so I can imagine that for health-related hazard, it's even more difficult, most probably. But for us, what is important indeed is to try to understand if our system will be triggered. So it's not only about monitoring something uh, which might become important, but what for us it's important is also to know if this event become uh, a disaster at European level where we need to coordinate the, rest, the EU response. I will finish here and uh, I will thank you uh, for having invited me, really, and um, it was very interesting and um, I hope to, to I, I, and I hope to receive all the important uh, uh, presentation I've been listening to. Thank you very much. Hey, we thank you very much, Olympia. Yes, of course, we will continue providing you information on the developments of the EUA. Uh, we, we, we consider this as um, one tool for uh, your arsenal uh, being towards the, 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 the preparedness and, uh, and, and the management of risks. Uh, in any case, we thank you again for your um, uh, kind um, attendance and participation and uh, contribution to the webinar. And uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce the next speaker uh, from Bernard Loft Institute for Tropical Medicine, um, Dr. Uh, Jonas Mita Hans Analyst. Uh, and um, uh, actually, Jonas um, is going to give uh, his view on the challenge, the discovery, ecology, and evolution of novel and emerging, re emerging arboviruses. Uh, Jonas, it's very nice to have you with us, and please take the floor. Thank you very much, Harris, uh, for the kind introduction and the invitation and the possibility to present our data. I know already we are late, so I will try to make it as uh, short as possible. I will. Uh, Share my screen. Sorry. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes, and can you also be as well? Oh, yeah, yes. yes. 
ausblenden. Ja, ausblenden. <lacht> nice thank you. Yeah, thank you very much again. Um, uh, first of all, I would uh, like to start with this uh, recent Nature publication. Um, it's very nice to see that uh, they analyzed um, these posts, the total reported cost of invasions that reached a minimum of uh, 1.288 trillion US dollars over the past few decades. The majority of the cumulative costs is related to uh, invasive uh, mosquito species, uh, such as uh, Aedes species, uh, such as Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, the findings call for the implementation uh, of consistent management actions and international policy agreements that aim to reduce um, the burden of invasive mosquito species, such as Aedes albopictus, and related arbovirus epidemics, such as West Nile virus, or dengue, or Zika or Chikungunya. This is what we try to achieve with Eva. The rise in global travel and trade has posed Europe to increase risk of introduction and expansion of ex exotic arthropod vectors and autochthonous transmission of arboviruses like dengue and Chikungunya virus, following new introduction from endemic areas. The identification of emerging outbreaks is rather challenging and requires a high degree of awareness and laboratory capacities. And this is what we try to improve over the last years, especially in Germany, where we faced so far no outbreak of dengue or chikungunya or Zika. However, we have uh, a lot of imported cases from endemic countries and we have West Nile virus outbreaks since two years. Um, West Nile virus uh, expanded the geographic range into Germany and caused an increasing number of human outbreaks. Uh, I think Daniel also focused on this, that uh, also in the Netherlands, West Nile virus uh, were detected uh, last year. And everybody remembers well the huge outbreak that Europe faced back in 2000. 18. So I will not go into much detail because we talked a lot about this. I will just focus on some general aspects. And this is a very nice uh, photograph that illustrates what we need to learn, what we need to do uh, to, to focus our research activities and our investments. Those interactions between vectors and uh, the application host and the environment. So um, there's one nice um, publication published already 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago by, by Ryzen. And uh, already 10 years ago, he focused on um, the improvement in landscape epidemiology. So at the advent of modern observational equipment combined with high-speed computing and artificial intelligence, as we knew from ECODEF, for example, has transitioned the science of landscape epidemiology from observational investigation to quantitative science. This is a huge step in science. Modeling change in time and space to define temporal patterns and spatial distributions remains a challenge for epidemiologists to fully understand conditions of needless formation, expansion, and subsidence. Translating forecast risk and observed patterns from surveillance programs into effective response plans has been hampered technically by modeling limitations and quality and rapid processing of surveillance information, but not anymore because of AVA. I would just like to give you a few examples that were not mentioned in the previous presentations, but uh, we try to focus in Germany. We try to focus on citizen science to bring together the data that we can observe from all peoples in Germany, because uh, Daniel mentioned it, the resources are very limited for professional programs. So we really rely our people that they work together with us with citizen science programs. So citizen science projects have an enormous potential to advance science. 
They may, may influence policy and guide resource management by producing data sets that are otherwise infeasible to generate. And one example is the so-called Mosquito Atlas or Mücken Atlas that was implemented nearly 10 years ago in Germany and provide excellent data about uh, a distribution uh, of uh, several mosquito species in Germany. And one example of this is also the spread of invasive, not indigenous species, such as Aedes japonicus. So, uh, and this uh, uh, picture, which was uh, recently published by a group uh, from the Friedrich Löffler Institute and SALF, you see that the data obtained by the citizen science program, so where everybody can send in mosquitoes and they were analyzed, uh, are uh, in, in line with the data that were generated with professional programs, so the dots and the red squatters. So they, they are exactly in the same area and this demonstrates very nicely the enormous potential of citizen science project, especially when it comes to invasive mosquito species and surveillance for an invasive mosquito species. In addition, Daniel mentioned already, we have also citizen science program for dead bird surveillance, so everybody can send in dead birds. And this has also enormous potential as an early warning for the emergence of uh, other viruses such as West Nile or Zutovirus. These are just uh, uh, parcels that we receive within one day. So uh, in a high transmission season back in 2018, you can see here the data. So we received uh, more than uh, 1,500 um, uh, dead birds in that year. This was a huge increase compared to the other years. And this uh, coincidence with a, uh, this large West Nile virus outbreak and West, uh, uh, West Nile virus and Usutu virus episodic in Germany. And when you uh, have a look here on this graph, uh, it is clear that dead bird surveillance can give you an early warning sign before sentinel hosts such as chicken or mosquitoes. So it's a very important um, data point that contributes um, to modeling. Um, Daniel showed you already this graph from the publication of Ute Ziegler back in 2020. And you can see here how this dead bird surveillance data contribute uh, to this modeling approach where you can see that this outbreak of, of West Nile virus occurred exactly in the area with a very low extrinsic incubation period, low than 10 to 15 days. So this uh, allows the virus, in this case, West Nile virus or Usutu virus to replicate very fast in the Culex mosquito and uh, to be transmitted to human and horses and cause disease in such animals or in the humans. And this continues to be uh, the case uh, also in 2019. So, so far we didn't have uh, any case here in the southwestern part of Germany uh, with West Nile virus. No mosquito, no bird, no human, no horse. So, um, but um, uh, Spiros also mentioned, and I'm always fascinated when I have fascinated when I see the data from uh, Macedonia and uh, how they uh, use the, the data and, and do this big data analysis also, including artificial intelligence. So I have to admit that we are light years away uh, uh, from, um, yeah, from those possibilities. And we really like to work in AVA to improve our chance to be faster and uh, to react properly, as we can see uh, in uh, Greece. Um, I would like to use the chance to focus on one issue as a virologist that was not mentioned so far. So we can use sequence data. As you can see, the power of sequence data now in the COVID-19 outbreak, we have awareness about new variants that might cause uh, problems uh, for our vaccination program. And the same is true for West Nile virus. So we sequence all viruses detected in birds, in humans, and mosquitoes. And then you can do this follow uh, a geographic analysis uh, combined with a molecular clock. And what you can see here is that there is not one introduction into Germany uh, with West Nile virus. There are several independent introductions back to 2004. And this is very interesting to understand that you have these so-called um, um, silent circulation uh, of an arbovirus, uh, and it would not cause any epizootic or epidemic. And then you have an explosion when the climatic conditions are ideal, and you will recognize that a virus is present, which was actually present since 
sometimes many decades. So this is very important data that you can generate from the virus sequences and that should and will be also used in AVA. Um, this is just also a nice example how the citizen science dead bird surveillance um, uh, can help us to better understand the spatial and temporal spread, in this case, of Uzutu virus into Europe. So where Uzutu virus spreads from which country and when, and this might also um, help us to um, understand what are the factors that contribute to the spread from one country to another and how we can react. The conclusions, and uh, I would like to make it short because we are limited uh, in time. Um, and this is somehow that we also learned from COVID-19 and which also applies to um, the other virus epidemics that we saw in Europe. The emergence of mosquito-borne disease in Europe is a wake-up call, how we live our lives. I think this is clear. Uh, we are pushing nature towards limits. We are stressing the environment. Thus, we are creating condition in which other virus epidemics flourish. Second, in Europe, we need to invest in epidemic preparedness. I think this is why we have AVA. We have invested millions of euros in the defense against an army that might never come across a border. In contrast, we have invested almost nothing in other virus epidemic preparedness in Europe. Those AVA is the chance to change this situation. Last but not least, the only way to achieve this is by working together in Europe. I think this is what AVA stands for. We as individuals, as a community, need to recognize that pure individualism gets us nowhere. In science, we have to act collectively in the face of an other virus epidemic. This is a hard thing to do, but that sense of community is what saves you in an epidemic. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would like all our collaborators that were also present in the se session, and especially our partners in AVA, and I hope that there will, will be more partners in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonas. Before I give the floor to uh, Haris and, uh, and Katharina, I would like to uh, um, inform you that we just posted a link to the video recording of the presentation that we unfortunately did jump over uh, from Gregory Lambert. You have that video recording of him in the chat, but we will also include it in the uh, video recording of the in, in entire webinar. So uh, we now jump directly to the Q&A. We thank you so much for all the questions you have posted. Uh, but, but Haris, I want you to conclude then this entire presentation section before we start on the Q&A. I think you're prepared for that, Haris, thank right? You, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks also a lot, uh, Jonas, uh, for, the, for this uh, excellent presentation. I would like to highlight uh, only two points of the Jonas' uh, uh, conclusion uh, that uh, we need to get prepared uh, for of the threat of uh, epidemics uh, and that uh, Europeans will have to work together. And I think this action group of uh, Eurozio is uh, providing us this big opportunity. It is a network, it is an action group, uh, it is a, a voluntary action. And, uh, I was very pleased to see uh, so few, uh, the key organizations like uh, the organization of Jonas, of Daniels, and all other colleagues from the other countries to have joined us and uh, working uh, uh, together. And uh, uh, what I have uh, to highlight is that it gave us the opportunity to exchange, to exchange know-how, important uh, um, expertise and um, that uh, gave the possibility to different uh, organizations from different fields. As we are working in the Earth observation field and the geospatial data analysis, Jonas is from the bio biological field and uh, other colleagues from uh, mosquito controllers, uh, mathematicians, uh, biologists, uh, 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 modeling developers. But uh, this Eurogeo Action Group actually gave us, for the first time, the opportunity to join forces and to work uh, towards a common goal, which is the uh, mosquito-borne disease uh, risk, uh, risk assessment, prediction, uh, and uh, support of, uh, of the decision-making in Europe, uh, uh, maybe in the future, in other places outside Europe, 
uh, towards uh, uh, the, the control of this problem. And uh, uh, I, I'm really thankful to all the colleagues and all the partners that have joined the consortium, that have joined the network, actually. I would like to refer to it as a network. And uh, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, we are open to uh, uh, welcome uh, and collaborate with more organizations uh, joining this uh, action group. Thank you very much. Now I will give the floor to my colleague Katerina to read uh, the questions that we have received in the order we received the questions. And uh, I, uh, I can't ask the presenters to uh, stay tuned and reply to the questions according to the order we received them. So Katerina, please uh, take the floor. Okay, thanks, Harris, and thank you all for being here with us today. So now I'm going to share my screen. I have gathered all questions. Can you see the, the document? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, we see the document. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the first questions were for uh, the next presentation. And um, can we invite Nikos to join the presenter room? I will. Uh, do you have, just before we do that, um, uh, Katharina, do you have any questions for Daniel? Oh, he's in the room. Um, yes, he's in the room already, so instead of. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, I, yeah. I have questions for Harris. So until, uh, no, I don't have a question for Daniel. I have for Harris, Spiros, Janis. And uh, Dusan, well, he, he answered the questions in the chat. And then I have the polls. Okay. So then, Daniel, if you don't mind, I will uh, uh, let you go down from the stage, meaning I will eject you, <laughs> as you, <laughs> you know from rehearsal. And then I will invite the first one was Nikolaus, right? Of course. Nick yeah. So until Nikos uh, joins us, uh, I can move on uh, with the questions for uh, Harris. Yes. Okay. So, um, first question is, can you please inform where to write to enroll to AWA? And uh, this information will be useful for different networks. Uh, from Miguel is the question. So, Miguel, okay. as I said, uh, you can uh, send an email at uh, Noah. Dot gr. Uh, I will also um, write to the chat the email and uh, yes, I'm entering the room. I'm entering the room. Okay. I'm I'm here. Okay. So, with your questions. So the first question is uh, is only a remark, basically. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, this is this is well known that uh, uh, some of the introductions um, are are due to the trade of used tires because tires usually have some kind of humidity and and and, uh, and uh, so the 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 they are breeding sites for the mosquitoes this is this is known yes okay and then we move on to the second question the second is seek outbreak occurred in India 2018 if we have to look at the there was no Probability of fire prey. How to improve? Well, this is um, this is true. I mean, this has to be addressed, of course, to the to the specific approach this group made. I just wanted to, with this um, simulation result, I just wanted to make the point that uh, the potential of these diseases uh, they they have uh, by even if you have an outbreak in a very remote place, it is an easy actually to have. Uh, to move through the major, maximum, this major interconnectedness we have today, to places very far away, and also Europe is not is not protected by that, it, you know. So we, it can happen also in Europe. This this is this is the point I wanted to make, specifically now to the study of Gartner. I cannot say more, but uh, of course we can improve also there the probability, you know. To, to think about how to improve the projections. It's a question of modeling. This is why we plan to do that. Also, in the context of the, the GRC is going, uh, has been collaborated with AIVA on that. And we will in basically be even more active in this context since we have established a research group uh, to work on that now. So we will be even closer to into the, the work uh, 
to improve the modeling approaches. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you very much. And uh, we can see here the first uh, poll, uh, which is, did you know that we have mosquito-borne diseases in Europe, with 93% answering yes, and um, only 4% not being sure. So, yeah, most of you knew that um, mosquito-borne diseases are just around the corner in Europe. Now, let's move on um, with the third question. Yeah, as I said, I will uh, write to the chat um, all the contact information of A.Y. and Dr. Harris Kodais. And now we're moving on with uh, William's question to Harris. Um, very interested to know where the 10 years of Sentinel-2 data came from. Um, yes, okay. it's true. It all right, yes, you're, it's true. Maybe I was not that clear in my presentation. Of course, uh, we, we use Sentinel data. Uh, since 2015, since 2016, that uh, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data uh, were available, but for the years before, we have been used other type of satellite data. Actually, a lot of the, of the activity of the action has been based on the processing of Landsat data, uh, as well as medium resolution data, such as uh, MODIS, I mean, data from uh, EOS and, uh, and Aqua uh, satellite missions. Uh, but but uh, yes, this is actually why I told you before that uh, AOI is a cloud agnostic system. Actually, we are accessing to the different uh, data repositories and uh, satellite uh, uh, data um, uh, storage systems and clouds. Uh, we used uh, CreoDS for uh, getting direct access to Sentinel data. We have been used uh, Google Earth Engine for getting direct access to lots of data, modest data, and so on. Yes, yes, you're right. Maybe it was uh, my problem that uh, it had not been very clear on on uh, the different types of satellite data that uh, have been used so far by by the AWA system. I hope that I have replied to the question of William. And there is one more question from Gina to me again. Yeah. Uh, ah, okay, about the timeliness of uh, the the delivery of uh, predictions. Yes, okay. There are two types. Uh, two two actually. Uh, reports, uh, one that it is provided on a, a big weekly basis. Um, it is uh, relating to the to the outcome of the models of uh, Bud and Bar presented by Spirus before, uh, that are uh, providing on a settlement basis, uh, day basis, sorry, big weekly data on uh, mosquito abundance and um, and, um, and uh, expected risk. And uh, also in regard to the human risk uh, assessments and reports, uh, we delivered uh, also of them on a, on a monthly basis, providing uh, information on the uh, uh, um, uh, three, four or five months in advance uh, until the end of the mosquito uh, period. So we have two, two different times of delivery of, um, uh, of reports. Uh, with um, mosquito and human risk assessments. Um, there is uh, one more question to me. Ah, okay. It's... Uh, yes, from Ramez. Uh, regarding AWA, which type of entomological data is required at what resolution? Okay, we are collecting entomological data from traps. Uh, actually, maybe here is uh, Spirus. I see Spirus in the room, so uh, it's better to give the floor to Spirus to reply. But actually, we are collecting data from traps. So uh, all the data that are collected by our by our partners, as it was shown by Daniel in, in his presentation, they are uploaded into the EWA portal, so that they become they are available uh, for the end users to, uh, to 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 be able to get uh, access to them and visualize uh, the collected data. And the resolution is uh, actually at the resolution, I mean, of the, of the network of traps that it is deployed in the area of interest. Spiros, I don't know if you want, uh, I don't know if you want to add uh, uh, something more on that. Or, uh... Uh, I, I will, I will, uh, uh, I will take over because the next question, Ramesh to Spiros, it's any quantified density of larvae or whatever adult mosquitoes for inclusion to the model, Brava. So what I want to say is that uh, we produce, of course, data. I mean, not only the ones that we have uploaded. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, Sandra Gevere was uh, working for months with uh, Elisabeth to upload all these uh, entomological data from Germany, France, Serbia, Italy, and our, and our own data, I mean, from Greece, in the platform, in the AVA platform. 
So this is a work in progress. Okay, now concerning the larvae and the adults, I know the larvae, it's really big data. I mean, that's the real um, treasure, I should say. The problem is that, okay, we have to uh, analyze them before to get any kind of, you know, conclusions or whatever. I mean, so, uh, yeah, we have been working on predictions with larvae from 2018, not published. But then, uh, if you like, I can, I can also, I can, okay, I can go also to the next, uh, from Adolfo to Spiros. Uh, uh, Katerina, am, am I allowed to do this or not? Okay. Because he say, I would love to hear how you link the sampled Kulix larvae, abundance and the adult. Can I, can, can, can you share, can I share the, can I have the, the, the screen? Because I will show some examples of how we're planning actually to move on uh, to link actually the larvae abandonments or the larvae predictions with the adults or the end or the predictions on adults. You want to send it to Can I? Yes, yes. Would be nice if, if we can do. Yeah, I mean, I have, some... I have to stop sharing. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, in the meantime, what I should say is we have a plan A in order to link actually larvae with uh, adults. Uh, because we have a network, let's say we have 60 traps, right, from which we collect regularly data uh, the last 10 years in Central Macedonia. So around each trap, now we'll show you uh, the uh, in a buffer zone of one kilometer, two kilometers or whatever, we can, you know, data, we can do data mining of these results on larvae and try to link the larvae in a buffer zone of one kilometer around the, uh, you know, ar around this uh, this trap. So this is what Sandra is showing to you. You he, you, you see, see here. Yeah. Do you do you do you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Sir. yes we do. Yeah. So you have here drainage canals from which you know in 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 the middle you have in in red the the trap which is collecting. I mean, functioning for the last you know many years. I mean, theoretically ten years or something like that and we're trying to uh, call to to link you know this data that we're collecting uh, for the last four years because that's the four years that we have digitized i mean actually this data to the to this kind of of of, of traps and plan b of course it's what we have already started we will try to correlate i mean to link okay uh, the ball i mean the 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 the, the predictive model for larvae to the uh, you know to uh, the bike. So th this is what I'm, I'm showing you now. It's it's a platform where, well, it comes. Well, if it does not come, I will. Okay. Well, uh, perhaps we don't have to show this. Okay. Just okay. This is just for you to understand that when we do two hundred thousand inspections, perhaps thirty thousand inspections or twenty thousand inspections per year, are in, in uh, around this buffer zones of these, you know, traps that we have uh, around the country. So we can try. So plan A is to correlate uh, actual larvae observations. Uh, when we say larvae observations, we mean abundances. We have, you know, five, again, classes of abundances. Uh, we have uh, data on the four uh, development stages of the of the larvae. Uh, what else do we have? We have Anopheles, Kulix, or, or, or Aedes. So we have this kind of information digitized geolocalized and with this we try to link adults with uh, you know larvae and the plan b which is now it's another thing because it's much perhaps we will have missing values we'll have problems with that we'll try to do this on the villages but by using predictive models for the larvae so that means that when we visit a village so we will measure again every 15 days or something, no, three, three, three weeks. You know, we will take measurements on larvae. So if we have, you know, this kind of predictive models for the larvae based on every week, so we can correlate then the uh, ball with the bud. I mean, the predicted the prediction on the larvae with the prediction of the adults and the prediction at the end with the risk. So this is the the idea. I don't know if uh, well, I caught you a lot of time, but. Uh, there's another question, I think. No, I mean, uh, there's another question for me. Yes, there is one more. Okay, I will share my screen again. Yeah. We have from Mr. Spiros, uh, where can I find more information? 
Okay. Ah, for the sentinels, for the sentinels. Okay. The, the, the yeah, very, very nice. Uh, I don't know, Chi a bit, but, but uh, okay, okay. nice, nice question. Uh, okay, we are using backyard chickens. We don't put chickens. We, it's a voluntary, it's a very nice collaboration we have. So what we do, we have something like 200 villages in the four regions, 50 villages per uh, region. So what do we do? We do a round and we collect, I mean, chickens, five chickens per uh, hen cook, uh, hen, hen cook uh, per village. So we get this kind of blood samples. We envoy, huh? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a collaboration with the citizens. So we have 200 guys, uh, you know, all over Greece, uh, offering us the blood of their uh, chickens, you know? So chickens, of course, less than six months. Under conditions, we then send this to Mackie's uh, Dobas uh, or to Vondas, I mean, to the two laboratories we work with in, uh, in Aristotle University and in Crete. And they give us the results so that we can then introduce these results in the uh, prediction that we can do in the bar for the West Nile virus. I don't know if I responded. This is the, the, the thing. So it does not cost money. It's just the uh, the money that uh, for the, you know, for the uh, consumables. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. So now we have uh, the second poll of the day, which is given the power of uh, open earth observation data, would you be interested in opening your entomological and data? So we have a uh, 61% uh, for sure, and then 22% uh, it will be difficult. Um, well, this is very encouraging, and uh, I would uh, suggest uh, that uh, you get in contact with us if uh, there is a possibility to serve data, just uh, contact us. Uh, this is a very encouraging uh, uh, outcome of this poll. Thank you very much. And um, I think I have to add here that the entomological and epidemiological data are only used uh, in order for the models to be trained and produce predictions. They're not at least currently shared uh, with uh, anybody else other than the team and the end users. Sure. Yes. Okay, I have two questions for Yanis, um, and I'm not sure he's in the room. Is Yanis in the room? Bende, maybe, you know? Uh, I haven't seen him. Uh, I call upon him, so I don't think he is yeah, here. I'll move on because he also had a problem earlier getting into the room. So uh, we have the next poll. Should there be a common European standard framework policy for an early warning system? And uh, we have a 50% uh, that says yes, and another 37% that says yes, but they know that this requires a lot of work. So. Harris, uh, comment on that? On that, uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, yes, okay, it's uh, it's one of the scopes of the EUA uh, network. Uh, of course, I can understand that uh, the 37% that is saying that it requires a lot of work, yes, indeed, it requires a lot of work. There is uh, an action that uh, needs to bring uh, brought together many different uh, stakeholders. Uh, decision makers, uh, scientists, and um, uh, and uh, uh, I mean uh, national uh, uh, national organizations. I mean working in the field. But anyway, uh, this is something that, like uh, Jonas said in his presentation, uh, in Europe we have to work together and uh, we have to establish some uh, common understanding of uh, how to face and how to um, to handle the problem. And uh, Europe, of course, is uh, everything that we have to do in Europe. It's not that easy because we have to collaborate many countries together and we have to decide on a common understanding and a common uh, um, uh, setting, I would say, of specifications and, and standards, but uh, we will try. But of course, um, uh, I understand it is a difficult task, but uh, we will work towards this. This is, yeah. this, this is at least what we what uh, what uh, we have uh, uh, in the in the framework of Eurogeo said several times, uh, and what the Eurogeo concept it is is so that uh, this is uh, my 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 first reaction on that. Yeah, may I chip in on that, um, Harris? Because 
as you, you, you may not have noticed, but this is a joint Next Geos and uh, Ava webinar. And Next Geos is a data hub and platform. And uh, during today, we have heard so much about different types of data. And uh, you, I know that you combine it, but in, in answering this question here or discussing this question here as a standard framework, starts with even standard uh, metadata about all the data that you collect. And uh, we have in NextGeos, which is also a part of EuroGeo, by the way, and, um, and, and then this is a, something that could be brought up for discussion and we have some experience with other types of data that might be interesting for this uh, early warning for mosquito-borne uh, born, uh, diseases as well. I'm just mentioning that as a, as a way forward because it's a lot of work as was, uh, <laughs> it requires a lot of work, but there's already done some of it. It's very useful. Useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Thank you also for mentioning Nexios and this European uh, data portal. Um, uh, we have, as you know, I mean, provided all the APIs for harvesting the data and making them open and available. I have also to tell to all our participants that all, uh, I mean, uh, data that can be opened and mm -hmm. that be freely available uh, are uh, can be harvested through our uh, APIs. And all our APIs are also available and open and uh, freely available in Git Hub so as to be used by other scientists. But of course, not all types of data, but the data that uh, we have agreed to, I mean, we have agreed because, I mean, it's not that all types of data are open and freely available, uh, but everything that has been decided to be free, it is free and it is open through the next years and other data portals, like Zeus portals. Maybe Spiros want to add something. I, I saw him raising a hmm. hand. Yes. I have the. Can I speak? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, what I say, we, we uploaded the entomological data from Greece from the ten years now. I mean, and in in the platform, in the Ava platform. So because I I see William Wind. I suppose this is. Yeah, he's asking if we have them. Yeah, uh, available. Well, actually, they are available, not for everybody, but after a certain. Let's say, uh, how say, uh, yeah, something like uh, an, an agreement or something. I mean, so why not? I mean, but but they are open and and uh, anyway, uh, they have been provided to the AVA. We are producing uh, the entomological data for the adults to the regions, and the regions, the four regions, are providing them to the platform, to the AVA platform. So they are they are open. I mean, so uh, the only thing is just okay. There's some kind of uh, you know. Uh, MOU or something to to deliver them to not not open open to everybody. I mean, I'm talking about the entomological, which belong actually to to, to eco development and to the whatever and to and to uh, and to the administration. I mean, in some way. But but it's, they're open. I'm I'm responding to the question of William Winter man, who made this kind. Of thing. Excuse me. I just saw the yeah, I, so it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just responding to this as well as. Okay, we cannot reply to questions directly to Ioannis, but uh, we will try to, 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 to reply them in chat. How is possible? Is it possible? This? Yeah, Ioannis is here with us. She can uh, answer the question. All right, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. oh, no. uh, so I have a question here for Dusan uh, and answered his uh, question. Um, oh, and I have a question. I think Spiros would like to ask how, the, how this correlation prediction system would work when other vectors of WNB such as Felix Perexidus are. Yeah, okay. Each species, okay. Hello to Nabil in Lebanon. Um, yes, each species has its own ecology, uh, its own preferences, its own mode of uh, mosquito control. So, of course, we can include, I mean, mammoth, I mean, the, the, uh, the model of, uh, you know, that was, was just a generic model and it has, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, incorporated uh, five, six uh, different uh, species. So why not? But, of course, the problem is, uh, does Nabil has enough data to provide and then I think it's, it's okay. Uh, we will try. I mean, the the, the data scientists of uh, NOAA will uh, try to get the, the best out of it. Okay, thank you, Spiros. 
And now I have uh, only, I don't have other questions here. Um, I have two more polls. So could AWA and the Eurogy action be a key lever for creating a standard framework policy for a very warning system? And um, we have 70% that think yes, absolutely. And 20% of this is not doubt. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I think. Uh, the, uh, I think. Uh, this, the, the, the webinar today has passed some message to uh, to our participants that um, uh, all this geo activity of the Euro Geo Action Group is uh, could work in this direction, and uh, this is what um, I wanted, uh, and uh, we as a network wanted to uh, to to make clear. Uh, today by this webinar um, and to, to showcase that um, a, a, we will continue trying our best for uh, uh, readying this uh, networking in the framework of uh, Eurogeo, uh, a useful and uh, enlightening, um, um, uh, uh, how say I mean, um, uh, uh, try and uh, try and to network for uh, the continuation of such uh, uh, activities, common activities that uh, have been, uh, as we understood, been, uh, in, in important to work together at European level so as to make them useful uh, and for the benefit of uh, the European citizen. And um, yes, I think uh, this uh, uh, result of this poll seems uh, again to me, uh, very encouraging for the continuation of our uh, action in um, in the next years. I have to tell you that uh, for the time being, the the network that we have established has agreed uh, to continue uh, its action for at least the next five years until the 2025 for uh, the exchange of know-how and the exchange of data. Uh, and uh, innovation sciences. So please uh, try to be on board. Uh, you will be uh, very welcome to exchange uh, with you and uh, share with you uh, uh, data and um, and know how. Uh, I don't know if, if we, we can... have one more poll, and I also have Janis in the room. He can answer. Ah, okay. The so questions. let's give the floor to Janis to answer the Okay, questions. and then the last one. Okay. okay. Uh, so, Yanis, you can hear okay. us. Uh, your two questions are here from Anastasius. Uh, what kind of demographic data do you use in your model and where do you get them from? Uh, okay, well, we use uh, mainly the human population data and uh, the area for each municipality or province. Uh, since we made this analysis for Greece and Italy, uh, data are officially from the Hellenic, Stati Hellenic Statistical Authority and the corresponding Italian Statistical Authority. Okay. okay. And then um, from RMS, uh, what are the climatic thresholds for of WNV transmission? At what level the outbreaks occurred? Climatic thresholds of Western virus transmission. Well, this. Uh, <clears throat> You talk about the, I guess you talk about the temperature grammars, you mean uh, the temperature functions you use inside the model. Uh, there is, uh, the climatic threshold is around 18 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, okay, and at what level the outbreaks occur? I don't, I'm not sure I understand this question. Do you understand something that we now have more? Maybe where was the temperature threshold we used for the model and then at which... No, the, in the model, no, this is fixed. This is fixed. It's uh, from uh, bibliographic data. Uh, okay, work, uh, work done from uh, biologists working on this, uh, endomologists, epidemiologists working on this, uh, on this field. We don't alter this. We use this as is in the uh, bibliography. And uh, we feed the, our model with uh, the ensemble of seasonal climatic uh, predictions. So, okay. Let's hope. Yeah. Just bibliographic data, yes. Okay. 
Just uh, and okay, maybe maybe Spiros want to add on that. Uh, yes. You want to comment? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, do I have? Yeah, okay. Um, yes, we can we share the, the the screen or not? Or is it is it complicated? Yeah, because yeah. I will show you just no, 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 second. before we close. Before I see that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. We don't have time. No. Yeah. What? I was going to I was going to say that it's amazing that we still have 76 persons uh, attending. So thank you so much for your interest. I think this is for the Ava team. This is fantastic. <laughs> so uh, but probably you should wrap it up uh, pretty soon now. Mm. Just a commentary then, if I'm allowed two three minutes. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, we don't have to, to, to have a screen. But in the in the features that I presented, uh, you know, uh, that that influence the bar and the bad, actually, we have introduced degree days. We have uh, introduced uh, climatic anomalies, hydrometeorological anomalies, and it, they are retained by the model, that, which means that we can introduce this kind of uh, you know, climatic anomalies. I mean, now we cannot uh, define them as thresholds or whatever. But it's it's all this kind of uh, time lags. For instance, uh, you did not have the time, but it's it's uh, precipitation three weeks minus or temperature three weeks minus or this kind of uh, you know uh, things, and which is very important. And also, perhaps it was not clear. We are using five days forecasts. I mean, two by two. I mean, which of course it's very very important because actually, uh, Yannick said it also, and, and everybody knows it. I mean that th their thermofields. And they have very specific, you know, uh, and Jonas talked about the, uh, uh, you know, uh, about the, the importance uh, on temperatures and dusen. So, I mean, it's very important to have this kind of uh, interplay between the environmental things and, and the anomalies and, the, you know, and, and also in these models, we took into, into, into consideration the population underneath 60 age, which is very, very important. It was actually the demographic data that uh, NOAA uh, took for us, I mean, ordered from the ELSTAT. So we have very fine demographic, uh, you know, uh, panorama. Okay. Thank you very much. I, 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 in case that Ramos wants to continue exchanging with Ioannis, of course, it is possible through by emailing to Ioannis directly or through me. Uh, I, I think by this uh, we have uh, reached the end of this webinar. Uh, uh, and, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Harris. There are two persons who have asked for the floor. Ah. Uh, I think uh, if they are still here, we they deserve to be <laughs> let in. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, so, Sama, if you are still here, I will invite you now. You were among the first to ask for the floor. So I promised you. So here you are invited. Um, can you maybe Yanis let him go out of the room? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you so much, Yanis. <laughs> you are a lift into space again. <laughs> Thanks. And you can uh, Kadria. Sorry. You can invite Kadria into the room. Yeah, I can invite him as well to see if. Uh, they can uh, come in here in case they are still here. We don't know that um, because we have we are one hour and <laughs> 10, 11 minutes over the stipulated time. So uh, but it's been a very interesting, interesting uh, webinar. I have to say uh, we run in next year's we have the next year's webinar series. So we have approximately one webinar every uh, month. And uh, I say I would say that this has really been a webinar, a topic of great interest. We have seen uh, more interest than in any other of our webinars. So congratulations to the AVA team and uh, to the attendees still here. <laughs> we, thank, we thank a lot. We thank a lot all the participants and all the attendees that are still with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I'm not sure if they they might have left um, the the webinar, so I, I we don't see any sign. So I think Harris, uh, like I said, congratulations uh, with such a wonderful project. And I have to say, for on behalf of next year's well, next year's NOAA, this so the National Observatory of Athens, 
you are actually a member of and contributing partner to Next Geos, just to say that. And um, and uh, it was briefly mentioned here uh, in the discussion that uh, you are also cataloging uh, the Beyond uh, Center data is also being cataloged on the Next Geos Data Hub, and you will catalog uh, some of the data and services services on uh, from the AVA on the Next Geos Data Hub. So. Uh, it, it's a wonderful collaboration, uh, and uh, I would encourage you to come up with new webinar <laughs> ideas, and we can uh, follow up. And but now I will give you the the floor for concluding this um, this webinar, Harris. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, okay, I, I thank you indeed for all the support that we have provided. And so I thank uh, the next year's team uh, for. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the collaboration, this fruitful collaboration for the last, I uh, think now, three or even more, four years. Okay? Yes. Um, uh, it is very useful that uh, Nexios is uh, providing this um, a, a data hub, uh, the so called European data hub, so that we can open and uh, make and share data. Uh, with the scientific community, and uh, this is, uh, uh, of course, I mean, very important for and very important contribution of next years to the to the community, and also for us to make all our activity and all our data and results visible to the to the to the. So it's completely win-win condition, and we thank you very much for uh, for, uh, for your support. As you said, uh, I'm uh, really thankful to all the attendees that are still with us. Uh, uh, I do hope that the meeting was useful and enlightening for them. And uh, don't uh, hesitate to contact us, to exchange further with us. And um, if you want to be part of this action group, yes, just please let us know. Katerina will uh, share with you in the chat my email. And uh, if it happens that I'm coordinating this action group for epidemics in Eurozip, I will be very glad to, to keep uh, sharing and uh, be in contact with uh, all the interested uh, stakeholders and partners and friends and colleagues. Thank you very much indeed. I think it's time to close. Uh, yes. Uh, it uh, took longer than we had uh, planned, but I think it was uh, an interesting webinar for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. And normally you get chocolate or a gift or something, but you you have to <laughs> you have to accept this lovely spring, virtual spring flower and uh, hepatica nobilis from Norway, and it's for all of you. And I and Harris, I I do have to say I I just love the Greeks. I mean, and and Katerina and uh, Mirka and Eleni and you. I mean, and Anestis, you have been wonderful to work with. You deserve the flowers, and also you in the audience for staying still on. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you, Ben. Always, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.